one is YouTube. We're not streaming to LinkedIn today. By the way, if you are now on LinkedIn, if you're checking the post, if you ever go to the post on LinkedIn, uh, don't click any suspicious links in the comments because there are scammers, as usual, on LinkedIn posting some scam links. Hello again, and uh, we are here today. The company called Some Expert, uh, Daryl Ullman and Alexander Golev. Uh, we'll start this the the actual stream exactly at uh, 3 p.m. London time, which is in six minutes. So if you're watching this recorded today, um, fast forward six minutes if you want to start to watch the actual training. And uh, in this six minutes, what we're going to do, we're going to allow you to kind of connect, you know, the audience to build up because it takes up to 20 minutes to get to the peak audience, usually in live shows on, on YouTube. We already have 26 people watching. Uh, so we'll see I mean, if, if we can tip over a hundred, that'd be nice. <clears throat> and what I'll do in these six minutes is just a bit of housekeeping. And we'll talk about who we are, uh, what this training is about. Uh, you can ask your questions. Uh, you can ask your questions in the chat. Please say hello. Please say where you are from, what brought you here, what you're expecting today, have you been through the last year's training, anything basically you want to say. This is going to be a Microsoft Licensing Basics training, the introduction into the mindset of a Microsoft License, um, Microsoft Licensing. Uh, very quickly about who we are. This is not a webinar, this is a training, but we just want to you know, keep, keep uh, uh, people informing about who, who we are a little bit. We are a consulting company with, uh, with offices in the, in the United Kingdom and in the United States. And we have uh, also EU presence, also actually EMEA presence as well. And we are on a mission to take complexity and BS out of Microsoft licensing and cloud economics. This is more of a joke. I, I don't know if Daryl agrees with me. I think, it, by the way, it still, it still uh, projects the essence of what we're trying to do because uh, we try to take away the complexity in various ways working with the clients, posting videos on this channel, running these trainings. So that, that's, that's who we are. Uh, what, we, what we do quickly, exactly, so strategic cost and licensing planning, cloud migration licensing planning, you know, you take your licenses, move them to the cloud, we help you plan it properly. So you're compliant and you don't spend too much money. Microsoft Agreement Renewal Negotiations is, is the core service from which this company started. SPLA, we love providers. SPLA governance, operations, audit defense, is PLA included. So if you're a provider, if you have a SPLA letter, send us a message. And cloud economics and FinOps, because that's the thing, you know, if you, if you transition right now these days from software asset management, you can't avoid cloud economics and FinOps. Uh, with me, I have Daryl, who's a partner in some expert and the chief negotiation officer, Daryl. Hi, great to see everybody or to, I can't see anybody actually, but uh, to hear that uh, you are on the channel and uh, you know, it's great to have everybody. I can see that people are joining, saying good morning. We have uh, um, participants from Toronto, from uh, the Emirates, uh, Sweden, the US, England, so just that's India, of course, so just that's a few of the participants from around the world. So again, this is a great global gathering of Microsoft uh, enthusiasts and licensing experts. And I can only say um, good luck and enjoy yourself. We've got an exciting ride ahead of us and you've got, I think, the best moderator and um, licensing expert, maybe globally, to your disposal, and that's Alex. So um, take advantage of the time you have with him. Believe me, I, I try to get his time, and I'm his partner. It's very difficult because he's a busy guy. So <laughs> utilize the time sorry. well. <laughs> sorry. Alex, thank you. Yeah, so because many of you came here for a training, not for our sales pitch. Uh, I would like to invite you to uh, tap into our knowledge, which we share openly, freely, and proudly 
on uh, our resources. So we have this channel. And if you forget how this channel is called, what you can do is you type in your browser, samexpert.tv. Should be easy to remember. Some expert TV, some expert television, and it will take you to the YouTube channel, to the YouTube channel's homepage. It's a redirect, and also we have a blog where we these days we write new articles. Uh, many of the most successful videos on this channel are repurposed as articles as well because we had feedback from various people, especially busy people in the, in in business, who said. Guys, we don't have time to watch your videos, but we may have time to skim through an article. So, so we publish this content on on, on our blog, and if you, uh, I hope you'll appreciate. We have very uh, uh, meticulous and a large pieces about SPLA, about Microsoft Enterprise Agreement, about CSP, and you you will probably won't find any any other article on the web that explains CSP not to partners who sell licenses. Those are plenty, but to buyers to procurement to to the client because microsoft did a fantastic job obscuring csp me mechanics from the end clients and in the end they sold value but there's a lot of economic um, benefit that is hidden so uh, yeah look at the article read what's written there it's, by the way it's not the longest it'll take you about six minutes to read um uh, what else so Obviously, if you if you want to talk to us, then uh, we are present on YouTube, so you can follow us there. We when when we publish new pieces of content, and sometimes we we share the also we kind of you know, remind people about the articles we have. All this material, almost all this material, ninety nine percent of it, it is is linked somehow from LinkedIn. So there's there's a feed you can you can get. Uh, we. Uh, have a mailing list and I made the mistake I didn't put it here so we have a mailing list uh, by all means I think it's it's in the comments to this uh, video on YouTube to this to this stream on YouTube there are two mailing lists so one of those those mailing lists is just our monthly the other one is for those who want to try our certification for free in January 2023. Those of you who follow us for, I don't know how many months, uh, who've, be, who've been here last year, may remember that we did eight training sessions. And then we, in January this year, we did a free certification. And many people tried it. Not many passed it. It's a, it's a difficult exam. But if you have it, you may, you may be absolutely sure. You know a lot about Microsoft licensing. In the, and, and it's not about the knowledge even. You understand how it works because that's what we will try i and daryl and we may have another colleague of ours joining us later uh that, that let me let that be a surprise uh, in the cloud section we'd like you after this training to go away not with memorizing how many calls you need to buy you know to to buy to license a windows server we'd like you to understand why what's the logic behind it what is what is unlimited virtualization? Does it make sense to use it? Uh, what's the, uh, the the basics of the enterprise agreement? What is the enterprise agreement exactly? What are the core features of it? So this is hopefully this is what you will take from this uh, particular session. As for other sessions that we did last year, they still valid. Please watch them with only one caveat. Uh, in two weeks from now, on the 1st of October, Microsoft is going to change drastically, bring your own licenses to, to the cloud rules. So anything that is related to cloud, we'll talk about it today, it's preliminary, but anything related to the cloud, verified in our previous year's sessions against the current product terms. I'll, I'll tell you what product terms is. If, it's, if anything is too complicated, just ask a question in chat, and we'll pick the questions that, you know, we'll pick up the questions that we, uh, uh, you know, uh, think uh, make sense to uh, respond to today. Oh, Carl is here. Carl, Carl, thank you. And Carl, by the way, thank you for telling me that there are scammers on LinkedIn. We have so many people from so many parts of the world. It's just amazing. Nigeria, Armenia, fantastic. Alex, Atlanta. We've got people from Mexico, from, yeah. from, from Germany, Singapore, Bangalore. Uh, I don't know, there's just a few other countries. Um, Pune from India, Indonesia, Puerto Rico, I, Angola, I don't know, 431 people. 
it's it's really exciting to have everybody join and um, and benefit from the knowledge here. So, Alex, it's yeah. um, Hi everyone. I mean, I mean, just to share, these are our long, long time followers here as well. So yeah, it's just fantastic. Uh, yeah, I, you know, we we should have some sort of a live map to to put pins in it. But need to think about that how to implement that, if that's even possible. Okay, so um, uh, we'll start. We'll start. And I have a few things to ask you. So ask your questions, obviously, uh, during during the live. Uh, Daria will probably be mostly monitoring the questions. Uh, it's a bit difficult for me because I have to present and see this, you know, ever scrolling line of, of comments. Uh, I'll explain to you about certification in a few seconds when we start the training, a few minutes. Uh, well, last year when we did this, it was uh, there was a fantastic experience when people from the community from in the chat responded to some of the questions in the chat. So please do that this year too. If somebody can you know respond to uh, to someone with a with a question, it's firstly it helps us and then it helps you to create new connections. So why not? It's a community. Let's let's communicate. Uh, make suggestions, contribute. Uh, if you're unhappy, let us know. Let us know why. Don't just say, oh, well, you know, we're happy. Just let us know. Please like this uh, stream and share it with your friends now as it's going live or, you know, the recorded stream because we want this to spread to as many people as possible because, well, we're sharing information today. We're not sending you anything. And, you know, invite your friends. So about the next sessions, I don't have a specific slide for it, but so please listen carefully. We want be doing the same as we did last year, i.e. making another seven sessions like this, because it was very confusing last year. And then we analyzed the interest around those sessions, and we realized that many of that material, although it's still in the exam, it's not interesting to, or, to, to the entire audience. So what we're going to do is we're going to pre-record the other parts of the training update them for 2022 and 2023 as well, because it's going to somehow spill into the 2023, I'm pretty sure. And we will be publishing them as live events in which we'll demonstrate to pieces from the recorded training, switching back to the studio and answering your questions live. So the promise is all the material and even more that we did last year will be updated. Uh, it'll be much better. It'll be more professional. And it will still be on the channel, so please follow this channel. Now, those who want to do the free certification, and even not free, even the commercial one, because if you want the commercial one, just drop me a line. It's £99 per person right now before the, 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 the free window in January. Uh, we can do that. Uh, members of this channel, if you become a member, paying member of the channel, uh, some expert TV on YouTube, after that, send me a message and say, I've become a member. This is my name. I'll send you an access code as well. That's, by the way, that's the cheapest and the quickest uh, way to, uh, to attend certification. Now, the important bit, watch the entire uh, recordings from, eight to, from 2 to 8 from the last year, because you need to learn the material from all the eight parts, including negotiations and audits, because questions... There are questions in the exam related to negotiations and audits. There are not that many, but there are questions in the exam. So, uh, and let's start the actual training. We have over 500, 550 people right now watching this, according to Restream. I'm not sure how accurate that figure is, but it, I'm pretty sure it's pretty accurate. Again, please like it so other people will see this. And please share it with your friends right now you, in your social media and you know, whatever. Um, so, uh, our, 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 uh, I would say associate partner, Stefan is, uh, also in the chat and he'll be responding to questions as well. And that was my surprise. So he'll probably join me for the cloud, uh, for the cloud part, which will be today. And here's what we're going to learn. Here is what we're going to learn today. This is the agenda. Some of it will be, uh, sort of re 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 reviewed, renewed, refreshed from the last year. And we have three new sections that are integrated into this starter training. 
We don't expect you to know a lot about Microsoft licensing to go through this training, that this training is actually aimed at anyone at any level. You just need to understand what a computer is, at least. But if you're here, I hope you do. I'll hide Daryl now, because uh, and Daryl will join us again when, when needed. So, uh, Daryl, I'll Thank see you, you later. <laughs> right, now it's only me. So, here's the agenda. Uh, without further ado, as uh, native say, if you watch this recording, there'll be chapters linking to all these parts in the description. So look in the description for the useful links as well. So when you watch recording, right now there's not a lot, but I will be adding uh, chapters and links after this recording is ready, after it's on the channel. The recording will stay on the channel. Uh, about the exam and certification, again, I'll repeat. So if you want to read about it, we don't support individual, we just don't have time. Please, please understand. We don't support individual requests about uh, certification. We have everything written on the website in the training section. There are three exam options. Again, the free one, wait until January 2023. The cheapest has become this channel's member. And if, if there's a commercial one, uh, 99 uh, pounds per person. All these options are subject to change. So if you'll be watching this recording in January 2023, the price may change. But for now, until, at least until the end of this year, this, these are the, uh, um, uh, the prices and the options. Disclaimer and copyright, we're not Microsoft. So please understand, we're not Microsoft. We're providing uh, our own training, our own uh, certification. And if you ask, does Microsoft do that? They don't. Uh, there is one website I'll show you in you know three slides from now where you can still have like a semi-Microsoft certificate. It's signed sort of by Microsoft. It's done by a third party and it's free. Uh, so what we do is completely, it comes from our experience. These are our battle scars. We're not trying to cover everything. We're trying to teach you the basics. We're trying to, to kind of put you in the right mindset of Microsoft license management, because what we find is the problem with lots of people in Microsoft licensing and procurement, in IT who's uh, anyhow connected to licensing, the problem, the, the, the biggest problem is that not that they don't know how to license a certain product. They just don't get the idea. They don't understand how Microsoft licensing works, the fundamentals, the, the, the moving parts. And this is what's going to be in this training today. If you have any questions, if you doubt anything, if you if you think we are not right, or you know you 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 you, you know anyway, let me go back to the word doubt. If you have any doubts, and we doubt ourselves as well, go to Microsoft Product Terms, which is this website. Very easy link: Microsoft.com/slash/licensing/slash/terms, uh, and there's everything. If it's not there, it doesn't exist. If you find, a, even, even from Microsoft, if you find a document that contradicts this, Azure Calculator, by the way, contradicts it, this is the golden source, not the Microsoft Azure Calculator. So, so double check with, with product terms. Uh, all right. <laughs> Why is free not the cheapest option? Because it's free. Uh, I mean, you have, to, you have to wait until January. So there's gonna be like a one month window. Um, and by the way, by the way, even without going to our website, a lot of important information about the certification is in the comments to these lives to this live stream on YouTube. <clears throat> right, this is the website I promised you, getlicensingready.com, where if you want to learn licensing, not how Microsoft licensing works, not, not in-depth stuff that we're going to discuss today, but the just the basics of licensing, how to calculate the licenses. Uh, how to buy licenses? What the, what is an enterprise agreement from the from the commercial point of view? You know the point of view of Microsoft. This is where you can uh, learn it, and I suggest you do, and try and aim for the master certificate. That's going to take you a month. It's all free. Uh, the, there are very snappy, short uh, trainings on each subject, and I think last time I checked it was like about about forty various modules in various. Uh, combinations. So uh, I have a master certificate, but I think I need to update it. I, it's expired. Yeah. Uh, you are certified for a year. Anyway, uh, here's, a, here's a question. So so throughout this training, I'm, I'm going to have some of these questions on the uh, on, on screen, which is for me to interact with you and to check your knowledge. So what do you think 
And if you know, you know, what, but what do you think? Are licensing terms the same for one product, say Windows 11? Are licensing terms for Windows 11 the same in each type of agreement, or are they different? I'll give you 30 to 60 seconds to, uh, to, give, uh, to give your answers, and then we'll move on, and, you know, we'll, we'll pick it up. Yeah, there's, a, there's an interesting uh, message from, from Khan. Get licensing ready. And by the way, Khan, hello. Get licensing ready is not up to date. It's, it's quite, I mean, it's not. It's, it, it does catch up because obviously, you know, any new updates, they need to go through a whole uh, bunch of steps to, to be published. <coughs> hello, Washington, D.C. <laughs> okay, so... Uh, so the, the right answer here is, uh, is B, uh, because the basic terms are exactly the same, but licenses uh, depend on various uh, uh, parameters, where you deployed them, what's the, the type of an agreement, how you use it, we'll get to that. Uh, so it's important for you that from the very start to understand that if you learn the licensing of a product, it, it doesn't mean that when you buy it through enterprise agreement, it's exactly the same as if you buy it through Microsoft CSP. If you're on procurement, you should have heard these terms, Microsoft Enterprise Agreement, Microsoft CSP. Please be aware. You change the agreement, licensing, licensing may change, may change. The other thing for today is this, this is a new slide. So somebody said, you know, in 20, and I think it was 2010, when I was presenting at a conference, uh, pretty high profile software sort of conference, so I won't, I won't tell you which one. Uh, and and there was a there was a, a session where I was arguing with the cloud guy. The cloud guy was like, "No, you know what? Cloud will come, and there'll be no licenses in the cloud." And some people still think there are no licenses in the cloud. Yeah, there are no licenses in the cloud, and and peaks can fly. So uh, that's that's the thing. So, do you know if licensing terms are the same on premises and and in the cloud? And um, please pay attention to the letter C D E. I'd say that yes or no, or, well, it's even more complicated. Are licensing terms for the same product exactly the same on premises and then the cloud? 30 seconds, and then we'll, we'll move on. By the way, uh, most people responded correctly, B, to the first question, so thank you. you, you, you at least I know you uh, understand, uh, understand the basics. Cloud is someone else's computer, exactly. <laughs> exactly, right. Moving on whilst you are responding, because I think there's a delay. So Microsoft software can be run, <laughs> Microsoft software is everywhere, can be run anywhere. There are lots of environments where it can, can, can run. Obviously it's on premises, it's in your office, it's in your home, it's in, you know, in, in your estate. That's, that's, that's easy, that's, that's the classic way. There's Microsoft software in the cloud, and uh, it's both pay as you go, and you can bring your own licenses to the cloud. And what's important is that cloud is also different. So, so there's no there's no one cloud. There are various flavors of it. We have the uh, outsources and hosting companies, and they, for those of you who don't know, they have three levels of authorization, of which we'll talk later uh, in the cloud section uh, today, which have completely different bring your own license rules. So you need to understand what sort of cloud you're moving into. And there's also, there are also listed providers like Amazon, AWS, Google, and Alibaba. So it's the AWS, Azure, Google, and Alibaba, which have even more restrictive rules, different rules to all the other providers. So clouds, there's not one cloud, there are different types of, of cloud. But we'll start with the basic thing. So uh, what is a license? What is a license? Funny enough, it needs to be explained. So software is licensed, not sold. You can't, you can't buy software. You can, buy, you can pay for a license. I, I even don't like the term buy a license, but everybody says buy a license. I don't like it. I prefer when I explain licensing to say you pay a license fee. You pay a license fee. In exchange for license fee, they let you do something with the software. If you do anything else, you might have to pay more or you become non-compliant, they can take you to court. And that's what, you know, during the audit, they, they find out whether, you know, they gave you this, uh, this bottle and said, you can drink it like this, but if you turn it like this, that's two million pounds uh, fee, or, or, you know, penalty. So that's, that's what licensing is. So uh, important thing about licensing is you cannot infer, if something isn't written explicitly, 
it does not exist. It just doesn't, you know. Oh, it should be common sense, but it's common sense because we're deploying this software here. We should have this right to, to use it. If it's not written, it doesn't exist. There is no common sense in licensing. It's, it's very important to understand. So you can't apply principles of common sense to licensing. You either have a right explicitly written or you don't. Simple as that. If you didn't find that something is allowed, it's not. So online services are licensed too, funny enough. So online services are licenses. If you read the, uh, the, the small print, you'll see that. Uh, services providers, even if you rent uh, virtual machines from an SPLA, from a typical service provider, they still have to uh, ask you to sign and use a license terms. So you still agree to licensing terms, even if you don't have an, an actual license. If software is free of charge, like the best example probably is Visual Studio Community. If software is free of charge, there is still a license. And it may be restrictive. So for example, again, Visual Studio Community, a very popular package. I see it in every audit, almost every audit result. You can't use it if you have more than 250 employees, unless it's for academic research, open source or something like it. So, so th there are strings attached, it's free, still licensed, still has rules you have to play by. Uh, what types of licenses there are in the Microsoft world? Again, this is an introduction training. And those of you who want to uh, more advanced, please don't drop off. We'll get to more advanced sections slowly to the, towards the end of, uh, of this session. This is a this is a typical scenario, very simple. Where we start is there's a user, user has a device, usually the, nowadays it's a laptop, uh, not a desktop, but maybe a desktop. The device is called a client, client device, because it's it's user's device. There are also servers, we'll get to that. Client device always has an operating system. Uh, normally in Microsoft, when we talk about Microsoft, we're talking about Windows, it may have a Mac OS, it may have a Linux, it, it must have an operating system because otherwise it won't work. On top of the operating system, inside of it, rather, we run applications and we access online services. Things like Office uh, Office 365, it's it's a combination of uh, of an online service and but some of the some of the Office 365 lands also allow you to install Office on your computer. It's still an online service, though. So things like this, like online services in the Microsoft world, in the majority of cases, are licensed with user subscriptions. So, if you want a computer, in the very, like the very simple start, you want a computer for a user with Office 365, you need to buy a computer, the operating system Windows will probably be pre-installed on it, and then you need a user subscription for that user to use services in Office 365. So far, so good. If something is not clear, please ask your questions in the chat. Daryl is helping me to uh, to pick up these questions. Uh, more complex. So the company grows. And instead of going to the cloud, which the majority of companies, they just go to the cloud and they stay at that level, user subscriptions, and, and probably payments for the virtual machines in Azure. If you have any service in your office on-premises, then you need... Server operating systems, that's another type of license. Server operating systems, Windows Server, that's the only operating system in the Microsoft world. And various kinds of uh, other server software, which is in this case, and on this slide, where I put SharePoint Server and SQL Server. To use them, it's not enough to only have server licenses. Don't forget that server software in the majority of cases, almost on every case, requires some sort of access licensing. CALS, CAL stands for Client Access License. If a software doesn't require CAL, it'll be explicitly said in the product terms and there'll be explicit um, conditions for it not to require a CAL. So by default, please remember that unless you know otherwise, a server software requires client access licenses. They may be per device, they may be per user, or you can have a mixture of them. It's, uh, it's up to you, absolutely up to you. A user call, when you assign it to a user, 
gives user access to server software from any device because the user is licensed to access server software. It doesn't matter what device that the user is using. Device calls are uh, upside down. So when you license the device, then any user using that device can use server software using that device. I hope that's clear. And the uh, important thing about CALS is that you only need one CAL for one piece of software, say, say Windows Server CAL, you only need one CAL for one user, and then it doesn't matter whether they access one server or a hundred servers, because a CAL authorizes the user to use the functionality of the product called Windows Server. I hope that's clear. I hope it's clear. It's not, it's not probably not that clear. Um, <clears throat> right, I'll hide, I'll hide the annoying ticker. Um, and please like this uh, uh, video if you, if, you, if you continue liking it. Um, <clears throat> CALS, client access licenses, may be sold in uh, bundles. And if you're on procurement and, and if you're on license management already, junior, senior, doesn't matter what level, you will probably, unless it's a purely uh, cloud-enabled company, still see things like core CAL and enterprise CAL. These are bundles. They have multiple uh, product calls in them. We won't be touching each, each and every of them today. We'll talk about them when uh, there'll be a dedicated training for server products. Also, these days, starting from about 2015, there's such thing as client access license equivalency, CAL equivalency. There's a page on product terms, on the product terms website, that is called CAL equivalency, color management license equivalency. So if you go to that page, what you will find, if you don't know yet, is that some of the online packages like Microsoft 365 or EMS, Microsoft EMS, contain access rights to various Microsoft servers. The, those, the set of those rights and those calls, equivalent, equivalent calls, is different per package. So check the details. Check every nitty-gritty detail. It also sometimes depends on how you buy them, through what channel. So again, pay attention to details. But these days, if there's a company with on-premises Windows Server and every, for example, every user there is covered with Microsoft 365 E3 and or E5, they do not need Windows Server cars because the equivalent rights are included with Microsoft 365. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a discussion in the chat. Uh, do you need me to... <laughs> do you need me to get involved in it? Or anyway, Daryl, do you want to pick it up? Are, are you following that one? Just a second, I'll opt you in. in can you uh, hear me or am I mute? Yeah, I can, I can hear you. Okay, no, there's, some, there's a conversation going on, one about operating systems um, and another one about Windows Kells and um, device Kells and, and uh, device versus user Kells and how do you count external users. So, I don't know, maybe just take Alex just two, three minutes just to talk about the difference between user Kell, device Kell, maybe what's happening in... Um, in uh, 365 about user calls and differentiate the two and a word about mm -hmm. external connectors because I think there's a bit of confusion going on. Yeah, there's, there's one question I, I, I just had on, on screen that, you know, uh, I have read an article from MS that using unli unlicensed toys is, le is legal unless used by... Um, you may have seen an article from MS. I, I, don't, I don't doubt that. The thing is with MS, as with any other source, even with Microsoft themselves, articles don't matter. So I'll be blunt. If it's not written in product terms, it, it doesn't exist. You know, whatever an article says. There are lots of articles on, on the Microsoft technical uh, website which contradict licensing rules, contra just blindly contradict. And when you get into a conversation with auditors, with Microsoft, they will only refer to the terms and product terms. Whatever is written in the article, in the article doesn't matter. They won't even take responsibility for it. So please be careful. Then, then about the keys. So I think I, 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 I'm trying to guess where this conversation is going into. Uh, Microsoft doesn't care what keys you use to activate software. In, in, if, if you get audited, they really don't pay attention to that at all. What's important is that you have 
is 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 you have the licenses for the type of usage that you are uh, executing. So how are you using it? For your type of usage. You have enough licenses, you are not violating the rights written in these licenses, they don't care whether KMS, any other activation, where did, did you get that key from? They don't. In, in the enterprise sector, when I'm not talking about home uh, home users. Uh, interesting thing. So SQL Server Call, I talked about bundles. I need to actually, s this is an important question that I need to cover. SQL Server Call is never, ever, 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 ever included in any bundles. SQL Server Call is always required additionally. If you decide to license SQL Server as server slash call, I'll touch on SQL Server licensing models later in this training. So SQL Server Call, again, is never included, neither in the enterprise uh, uh, call, call bundle nor in the core call bundle nor in any of the Office 365 or EMS packages. SQL Server Call is always standalone. <clears throat> yeah, Alex, I, right. I suggest we, we continue with the sequence we, yeah, of the presentation. I, I, I'll carry on. So uh, in addition uh, to internal users, you may have external users. So external users, again, I'd like you to remember that, that rule that I already said. Software requires client access licenses, server software, unless there's exception. And with external users, the rule is still, it does require calls, but maybe sometimes it requires external connector. Some products have exceptions. For example, SharePoint in the latest versions says that external users do not need neither calls nor external connectors. Again, it's an exception. It's an exception. So, um, this is a, this is this is one for you to interact with us. Uh, if you understand the concept of user and device calls, if you understood it, I'd like to I'd like to see whether you understood it or not. Uh, if there are shift workers, say there's a factory, and there are three shifts, and people are using the same computer in various shifts, which call is better, device call or user call? Economically. Shift workers using one, so, 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 so in a simple example, three people use one computer. Okay, um, we have lots of questions about calls in the chat, by the way, so for some reason I can't put them on screen. I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm still trying. It's not. It's not appearing on screen. Can you see me? Am I frozen? No, I'm not. I'm not I don't think. I don't think I'm frozen. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Um, for some reason, I just can't put it on screen. I don't. I don't know what's going on here. But anyway, uh, let's move on. So, uh, the question was. Will not user be constrained to use the software like MS Office to use only one device if that organization has device calls instead of user calls? No, because Office has nothing to do with calls. Office is licensed with its own licenses and server software access is licensed with its own licenses, so they're not connected. It's, it's important. Right. If I drop off, I'll reconnect, I promise you. Uh, Something is something is going on with uh, with my browser, so um, please bear with me. Uh, so. Yeah, the uh, actually the, the right answer here is C. Why? Because because uh, device cow is you don't need one cow, and you would need for these three users you would need three cows, which is roughly three times more expensive. It's not exact three times, but very close. So obviously, because every user of that licensed device will then be able to access uh, server software through that with that device call, only one device call. So yeah, uh, device, calls are, device calls are more economical for factories. So here's the list of what's coming up next. So the next section is way to acquire by Microsoft licenses. And as you can see, we're getting towards the end. We've, uh, we've gone through already two, set, two, two sections. So there are various ways to acquire
Why? How you buy licenses, basically, for Microsoft? So 90, 90%, 90% of licenses are still sold through uh, volume, so-called volume agreements. So if you have heard, or if you haven't, the terms of, the terms like enterprise agreement, MPSA, open license, open value, select plus, these are all volume agreements. No, note that I'm not saying CSP. CSP is a different beast. Many licenses for Windows 11 and Windows 10, maybe, still, uh, come with pre-installed with computers. That is called OEM, Original Equipment Manufacturer. So if you buy uh, laptops these days, they you know, there's a 99% there's, there's a chance you'll buy them with Windows, unless you're buying Mac laptops. Some licenses may come with third-party software. So if a, if, if a software vendor develops... Uh, say, an accounting package. That accounting package may require SQL Server. In that case, they may either ask you to license SQL Server or, for your convenience, bundle the so-called ISV licenses with their application. You may only use that license with that application. But what's important is that you remember, you have somewhere written down, that, for example, this particular SQL server that you have, the database, is licensed with the license that you got with a nice V software package. That's, it's, it's a key thing. You need to remember that because then when you count the licenses you need, you don't accidentally also think that this server also requires additional licenses because you already have it. So just please, please, please pay attention to that. Some of the licenses you get through CSP providers, and those are your licenses. They'll sell them to you through, through the CSP agreement, through the Microsoft customer agreement, through the CSP channel. And some of the licenses will, you will not have is when you rent something from an SPLA provider, you won't get the licenses. They pay for the licenses, and they just charge you a monthly, monthly pay-as-you-go fee for, for SPLA. You may buy licenses online from Microsoft, and that's, you know, that's what we did when we opened this company. We were a small business, and I just took my credit card, go, went online, bought Microsoft 365 packages without any C CSP partner, just directly from Microsoft. And one of the, one, uh, the last option, probably not the last, but uh, you know, six is enough, I guess, for this slide, is the retail, so-called fully packaged product. It's, it's what you buy from, uh, uh, from a retailer. Funny enough, these days, you'll probably buy a card with an activation key, it's still it's still called professionally. It's still called fully packaged product. Don't ask me why. ISV. So we have a question: What is ISV? ISV stands for Independent Software Vendor. As I explained, it's a it's a company that, for example, develops an accounting software that may bundle Microsoft software with it with a so-called ISV Independent Software Vendor license. You pay for that license to them, not to Microsoft. Right. <clears throat> okay, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Carl. Moving on. So, depending on how you buy licenses, terms and conditions for using software depend on how you bought it, through enterprise agreement or through CSP. And we have videos on the channel. Please subscribe to the channel. Please watch all the videos. We have all, almost 200 public videos on this channel. We have videos, I think two or three, that talk about differences between enterprise agreement and CSP that can, if you don't understand them, they can just completely break your licensing, make you non-compliant. Same products, different agreements, different rules, important. The other thing is Microsoft licensing evolves and uh, if you have a license, I'm not saying what you're running, I'm saying what, what license. If you have a license for Windows Server 2008 Enterprise, the rules, terms, and conditions for that license are completely different to the ones applicable to Windows Server 2019 today. And obviously, editions like Data Center and Standard, they also have differences. And let me touch on versions and editions because versions and editions are not the same. Uh, I get extremely pissed off by Google when I ask for an addition of software and it returns me versions because they're not the same. Even Google confuses them. You, please don't. Because what's a version?
version. A version is basically the age of the software, when it was released, the release timeline. And these are editions. Editions, editions are the size of the package. Functionality and cost. Cost, importantly, data center costs, uh, SQL Server data, uh, sorry, enterprise. This is a good example. SQL Server enterprise costs exactly four times SQL Server standard. So again, versions are 2008, 2012, 2016, 2019. Those are versions, not editions. Don't call them editions like, oh, we have 2019 edition. That's a wrong statement. And on the other hand, which version is that enterprise? Wrong statement. That's an enterprise edition. Edition. If you don't have this in your head properly straightened, then you'll be making mistakes. You know, you, it, it's, it's, quite, it's quite often that we see mistakes made because of misunderstanding of what's a version and what's edition. Terms are also different depending on, on whether you install software on a hardware server, just, just a box you bought, server, or you deploy a virtual machine, a pretend computer, we'll touch on virtualization, and then deploy it there. Terms and conditions for usage will be different almost in every case. There are exceptions, but then anyway, uh, please remember that. So you, you can't just move from physical to virtual and assume you still have the license. Mm, you probably know. Terms again are different, whether you access software locally or remotely. Some software may be forbidden from uh, being installed in a server in the office, and then uh, you know you giving access to that server to your home users, Maybe you're not allowed to do so. You need to check. It's not automatic. Uh, and obviously, obviously, but not for everyone, for some reason, terms for the same server software is completely different, whether that's on-premise or you deploy it in the cloud. You take your license and bring it to, your cl to the cloud. You're allowed to do so with some licenses and some types of clouds. But, but the, even how you calculate the licenses may be different in the cloud compared to on-premises. And usually it's more restrictive. Terms are also different whether that's production or development, obviously. So usage for development may be cheaper, but then the licensing models are different. We'll touch on them today. It'll happen, I promise you. And whether it's used by employees or externally, by the, the outside world. Again, the terms and conditions may be different. So it's not like you know you you just license, you just you just uh, learn how to calculate core licenses for SQL Server. You need to understand whether that's in the cloud, whether that's production, whether that's active or passive. Well, so so with SQL Server, for example, that's one of the most complex licensing models. There are almost fifteen factors affecting how you license SQL Server. So, and we'll have a dedicated SQL Server training. Uh, approximately January, February 2023. So, here's a tricky question for you. What edition is the SQL Server 2012 instance? 30 seconds, and I'll, I'll have, a, have a little uh, sip of water. Daniel suggested we have five minutes break every hour. Have we gone through an hour? Not yet, so 20 minutes. In 20 minutes, we'll have a break. Um... Yeah, so type your answers in the chat. I'll, I'll see them. So what, what edition is the SQL Server 2012 instance? And I will move on. Um, uh, just a sec. Daryl, I'll put you on. Uh, are there any questions you'd like me to take? Yes, Alex. There's actually a number of interesting questions that have come up. Um, one of them is around licensing management. So there's a conversation mm -hmm. about where do I actually see my volume licenses? How do I track the number of licenses I've purchased, my organization has purchased? Um, if, I, if there are organizations that have been um, merged into our organization, how do I actually know what licenses they brought? Let me check whether I, 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 I have a slide for it. I, I, uh, I'm not necessarily in this training. Uh, but I can pick but it up. Just in general, note, because there's a lot of discussion around Azure about 365 portals. It's 
not exactly volume licensing. So just a word on that. Okay, I, I can explain. I can explain that. So uh, unfortunately, I don't have a slide. So please listen and take notes. So if you have volume licenses, so you bought licenses through Enterprise Agreement, MPSA, Open, Select, those licenses you will see in the portal called Volume Licensing Service Center, VLSC. That's for volume licenses. Licenses bought through, sorry, M minus MPSA. That If I said MPSA, that was a mistake. MPSA, Microsoft introduced that product, uh, that licensing program, I think all started it like 12 years ago, a long time ago. It was supposed to replace the entire volume licensing and it didn't, but in the process, they created a new portal just for MPSA, which is called Microsoft Business Center. So you have a separate login to Microsoft Business Center for your, for your MPSA licenses. If you buy licenses through a CSP partner, or even directly from Microsoft, through the Microsoft Customer Agreement slash CSP, those licenses you will see in the Office 365 admin portal in your tenant. So that's how complicated it is. There are at least three sources where you must look. There is a file you can ask Microsoft to produce, which is called Microsoft License Statement, MLS. Take notes. I don't have a slide today for it. MLS has two types of licenses. So by default, unless you ask, although these days Microsoft tend to include it, they won't include MPSA, or MPSA sorry, MPSA. They will include Enterprise, Open, uh, Select Plus. That is going to be in the MLS, in the license summary, how many licenses you have, very much reflecting what you see in the VLSC, but much, much more data because the, the entire history of your purchases. MPSA data will not be added to the licensing summary. So if Microsoft decides to add it themselves or they, uh, you ask them, there'll be a separate tab on the MLS called MPSA, and you will have to perform calculations on that tab manually, yourselves. And the uh, cherry on the cake is your CSP licenses will not be on the MLS, and you will have still to go to your Office 365 portal and check your CSP entitlement there. So that's how, you, uh, that's how complicated Microsoft licensing management is. When we uh, engage with clients to assess their licensing uh, position. We usually don't produce ELPs because ELPs, one time, one of ELPs make very little sense, but we use it as a tool in the process of assessing licensing strategy. So we still do it. We take MLS, we ask to download CSP licenses, and we always ask Microsoft to add MBSA on the MLS so we have the entire list of licenses in addition to that. If you have had any mergers or acquisitions, any license transfers. If you're in Europe and you sold or bought secondhand software, that's never going to be on any Microsoft sources. That has to be added and deducted manually from the summaries. So we as consultants, licensing consultants, we always perform all the calculations manually based on all the transactions that we find in those documents. We never trust the summaries. Summaries are often off. Not always, but more than half times, summaries are off. So... Alex, Good question. Yeah, MLS, forward on that. MLS will be consolidated for multiple tenants. Uh, there are no tenants on the MLS. MLS is not for CSP licenses. For the, the tenants did not exist when MLS was created. It's for old school enterprise agreement licenses. That's what it's for. There's no, there's no tenant. But there'll be entities. So your affiliates. And all the licenses from those affiliates, you have to actually check if the list of affiliates is correct. And if it's correct, then all the licenses will be on the MLS. Um, <clears throat> volume licensing cannot be purchased through CSP. Sorry, you should don't mix those terms. Volume licensing does not. So CSP is is not volume licensing. It's a it it's similar, but it's a completely different uh, uh, licensing program. But fine, I'm I'm actually picking your own words. Uh, yeah, so so it doesn't matter how you buy a license through a Microsoft Customer Agreement. It should appear on your tenant if your tenant is correctly configured. So you, how you buy it directly from Microsoft through an enterprise motion, we'll touch on that. Through, uh, through a CSP partner, it will still be 
uh, in your office, this is five on your portal, in your tenant. So, so make sure the licenses are correctly assigned to the tenant. Okay, moving on. Because we, we uh, yeah, that was that was a very good question. And actually, I regret that I deleted that uh, slide uh, from today's presentation. Um, you know what? The, let's skip this one. So, so, so we we're moving on. We only have seven sections to go: uh, subscriptions uh, and perpetual licenses, fundamental terms, definitions, licensing model, and metrics. High level overview of the most popular product licensing. So, in the service equal server, uh, etc. Microsoft three six five introduction. Cloud licensing and bring your own license basics. So everything connected to cloud and you know, deploying your license with a provider. And uh, licensing agreements basics. So we'll touch on agreements. That's that's the agenda for the rest of this training. Uh, so we need to proceed. Uh, what are, so, so there are perpetual and subscription licenses, but before I explain you uh, perpetual and subscription licenses, let me uh, introduce you to the uh, term software assurance. Because apparently it's unclear, uh, but I've been in licensing for 20 plus years. You get less for murder in some countries. Uh, so I understand that, but it's every time I have to explain it. So software assurance is Microsoft's name for what other vendors call maintenance. It's an ongoing and recurring payment that you have to pay even when you bought a license. Why would you buy it? I'll explain. So... <clears throat> As I said, it is a subscription, and from the financial terms, unless you know how to properly make it CAPEX, it's by default it's OPEX, operational exp expenditure. Software assurance, since 2012, adds critical rights to the license. So if you buy a license without software assurance and license with software assurance, you get almost like two different products. Because licenses without software assurance are crippled let me use that word, crippled, compared to license with SA. And Microsoft did do it on purpose. They want your recurring subscription. They want you to continue paying for software assurance. In exchange, of course, they give you benefits. Those additional rights, other benefits, we'll, we'll discuss them now. There are also non-licensing benefits, and there used to be many non-licensing benefits, like training vouchers, deployment vouchers, blah, blah, blah. You know, nice package, but they are shrinking uh, probably because Microsoft, in my understanding, Microsoft is trying to, if not to kill software assurance, but make it less uh, appealing because, because CSP doesn't have software assurance, and obviously in CSP you don't get any non-licensing benefits. Uh the core benefit of software assurance is the so-called new version rights. What does it mean is, you know, during your act active software assurance period, as long as you keep paying, you have a right to upgrade to any new version that is released during, during the term of the active software assurance. So here's an example. So if in, uh, I need to hide something here on my screen. If in 2017 you bought a license for Visual Studio 2015, um, let's not touch editions because Visual Studio allows you to upgrade from an edition and downgrade from edition to an edition when you renew it. Uh, <clears throat> that's the only product, by the way, that does that. So <clears throat> you bought in 2017 version 2015 with software assurance. Software assurance through enterprise agreements lasts for three years until 2020. That's why I have 2020 on this, uh, on the timeline. Three years of software assurance. Microsoft in 2017 releases version 2017. That gives you a right. You don't have to. It's important. You don't have to. You have a right to upgrade to 2017. If you decide to upgrade, fine. You upgrade it. You have a right to do so. Although you bought 2015, but because you have a say, you may upgrade to 2017. In 2019, you may upgrade to 2019. And then in 2020, imagine you decided to stop paying software assurance subscription. Like, fine, you know, I've had enough. I have a perpetual license, or if I had a subscription, you know what, I, I just decide to stop it. I fired these people. Doesn't matter. You cancel to say. You still have rights because you had that essay until 2020. You still have rights to upgrade a perpetual license, uh, perpetual license, li in instance, license, but perpetual license, to 20, 2019. You keep it when it expires. So what's important is you have rights to all the versions that were released during the active period of SA. But it's not an obligation. You may, if you want to keep 2015, 
upkeep 2015. You could even install Visual Studio 2005 using downgrade rights, which we'll talk about as well. So the other vital use rights, and this is where software assurance is a killer. It's when you, so, so please pay attention what you get through software assurance because bring your own license to the cloud, the majority of licenses, like the vast majority of licenses, require software assurance to be brought to the cloud. Otherwise, you can't. You just can't. They, they have to stay on-premise. Server software and virtual clusters. If you have, you probably have virtualized uh, VMs in your, in your estate. They require software assurance in the majority of cases, again. Hmm? Remote access to Office applications requires software assurance. Free SQL Server instances for failover. So you deploy a database server, you can actually have another secondary passive instance for free, but that requires software assurance. Otherwise, you have to pay for it. Unlimited SQL Server virtualization. So say you decided to deploy like 20 SQL Server Enterprise instances on a single host, and you want to license it for unlimited virtualization, that requires software assurance. Imagine now it expires. So CSP does not have a say. CSP does not have software assurance. It has equivalent rights. They are not 100% equal. You have to check in product terms per product. There's not, there's not like a single place where they describe all the, CSP, uh, all the CSP benefits that are equal to software assurance. You have to go to the SQL Server page and see that. So then, again, not 100% equal to software assurance, but, but most of them will be. They only exist, those rights, equivalent rights, in subscription licenses in CSP. CSP also has very crippled, very cut down the purchase licenses. They don't have any of the equivalent software assurance rights. They really like for a small business with one server without virtual machines. The usability of those licenses is very, very limited. Uh, license lifetime. So I keep saying perpetual license. I'll explain it to you what that is. So perpetual license is license that never expires. You paid, fully paid for it, and it never expires. It's forever yours. Even when Microsoft says it's end of life, you'll be approached by salespeople saying, your license has, you know, it's, it's expired. You have to buy a new license. No, you don't. You don't have to buy it. If, you're, if your IT security tells you we need new licenses for security reasons, that's, that's, that's a valid argument. But your licenses that are perpetual, they never expire. Nobody will take them from you unless you do something really bad. Uh, then there are licenses perpetual with software assurance. So how that works is that you, in the beginning uh, of that license, you pay for license, and at the same time, you can buy them separately. There's one exception, OEM, but... Normally, you combine them separately. You have to pay for software assurance. You basically pay for one item on the price list. That gives you a license that never expires, plus software assurance that does. So to keep your rights that you get through, say, you have to renew it. And you cannot have a gap in software assurance terms. You just can't. There's no way. So there's no way to reinstate software assurance. If, if, if it expired and you forgot about it, you're like, oh, I need software assurance. You basically have to buy a new license or subscribe to a new license. But there's no way you can go back to Microsoft and say, I'm sorry, you know what, in March, our SA expired, can we buy SA again? No, you can't. It has to be back to back. Uh, <clears throat> and subscription licenses are sort of easier. It's, it's a subscription. It's an on and off. You pay for it, you can use it, it expires, you can renew, or you can drop it, and then you can resubscribe when you need it. Gaps really don't matter. So subscriptions are easy in, the, in, in that regard to understand. So uh, subscription licenses in uh, volume licensing, and uh, as I called it old school here, so subscription licenses, always include software assurance rights. So you get all the software assurance rights with any subscription license in the volume licensing channel or software, software assurance equivalency in CSP. So, so you, you don't have to think about it. Actually, in the current world, I am more on the side of subscriptions than uh, perpetual licenses. That's, that's my view, but you, know, you may have a different one. Here's a question to, uh, to, to understand whether you understood what I just explained to you. And sorry, I'll bring you, I'll bring you back online. Uh, so the question is, your software assurance expired on the 1st of March this year. Today is 14th September. You need software assurance. What are your options? A, reinstate SA from the 2nd of March. 
B, buy new license with SA, C, buy subscription license. What, what are your options in this case? Is just there anything? Think back to, just think back to what Alex said regarding software assurance rights and, re, and renewal rights. One of the most important things with software assurance, and we've seen it many times over the years, is that people let it lapse, and then a number of months later, when usually around SQL Server, that the organization needs virtualization rights, and they go back and they um, start to verify if virtualization rights are, el they are eligible, and they find out that software assurance has expired. And they go back to the reseller and they ask them to um, repurchase software assurance, even um, um, dated back to the expiration date. The answer is very, very simple. It cannot happen. So if you let your software assurance lapse, you have actually thrown away your perpetual license or your software assurance rights, and you're going to have to either repurchase at a full price, perpetual plus software assurance, or then the recommendation, of course, will be to purchase subscription licenses that are much, much cheaper. So I think you understand what the answer is. It's B and, and C. You need to, yes, thank you, Donald. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, see, exactly. Buy subscription licenses. So the bottom line is that when you're managing licenses, and this is what Alex started the presentation with, it's not about remembering the bits and bytes of what you can and cannot do with licensing. It's very difficult. It's to understand the concepts. And then once you understand the concepts of subscription licenses, of perpetual, of software assurance, on-premise licenses versus, uh, versus 365 or Azure licenses, you can actually start managing your estate in a way that you can optimize and you can avoid waste. And that's, that's really the bottom line, avoiding waste and optimizing your estate. So you need to watch out for these caveats uh, around that area. So I'm actually going to take... Alex, do you want to take a five-minute break and maybe I can answer some questions while yeah, we get I mean, a coffee? I'm, I'm, or, I'm here. Or, I'm just, I'm just, okay. I'm just reading. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I'm here. Wanna... I'm just reading stuff. I'm reading questions. Yeah, so do. I'm kind of taking break. Please help me. Uh, no, no, by the way, no, by the way, yeah. just one thing. Remember, I asked you what's the edition of the SQL Server 2016 or whatever the question was. There was no edition. So the, 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 it was a tricky question. In that question, there was no edition. It, it just said, what's the edition of SQL Server 2016? We don't know. Because 2016 is not edition. So, so the, answer, the correct answer there was, who knows? <laughs> so there's actually uh, yeah, a good please. remark here about getting special approval from Microsoft if you want to backdate and renew software assurance after it lapsed. So... Anything in the world of licensing with Microsoft directly, I would always say anything is possible. But you are in a world of, um, usually you need to be a very large organization, you need to have a good relationship with Microsoft, and it's always an exception. And with every exception, there's a cost. Microsoft is going to want something from you. So um, if you can avoid lapsing your software assurance, please do, because otherwise it's a very, very difficult battle to actually reinstate software assurance. In most cases, you won't be able to. If it's 15 days, 30 days, 45 days, and you've got a very good reseller that you work with, they might be able to get you an exception. But I wouldn't use it as a standard uh, a process within my organization to uh, 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 hopefully have Microsoft um, be open and uh, uh, um, and working with you to resolve that issue. I wanted to pick up on something so really interesting, but I lost it. Um, yeah, there's a lot of questions going uh, on. Yeah, with, um, with the server data center, with the say it can be used for virtualization. Of course it can, yes. Yeah, so so say is not required for with the server data center for virtualization. There was actually there a question, Alex, really, really quickly. Maybe you want to just point out. 
So there was a question regarding um, the um, um, virtualization on SQL Server and Windows Server. Do mm -hmm. you need software assurance for SQL Server if you're virtualizing and you've got vMotion, for example? And is it yeah. the same requirement for Windows Server or data center right. edition? So uh, this is a, this is a, this is an extremely interesting question because October first is coming. Until the first of October, the rules are as follows: SQL Server requires software assurance for virtual machines to be put in a cluster and move from the host to host. It does. I'll explain it. So I'll have a, I'll have here a section where I'll explain how this works. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, SQL Server does. Windows Server right now doesn't have the so-called license mobility rights that you get through SA for SQL Server. It doesn't. So Windows Server, if you have a virtualized cluster, the prudent approach is to buy Windows Server, data center, the host, and then get unlimited virtualization. SA doesn't give anything right now, at the moment, doesn't give any additional rights to Windows Server except for new version rights. Really, just, just nothing. Well, I'm wrong. It gives also Azure hybrid use benefit. So that, that one is, if you have Azure, that, that one is valuable. Otherwise, no other rights. So uh, from the 1st of October this year, in two weeks from now, two, two plus weeks, Microsoft promised, and I'll give you 99.99999%, almost 100% probability that is going to happen, to introduce a new right for cloud bring your own license and for on-premises virtualization, which will be called flexible virtualization. So flexible virtualization will require software assurance. And flexible virtualization will allow you to license Windows Server like you do with SQL right now per virtual machine. And then for that virtual machine to move around the cluster, you will have to have software assurance. So software assurance, basically, software assurance, remember that, is in most cases is required for virtualization. Right now, Windows Server is an exception. There's no requirement for virtualization of software assurance right now because, well, there's no license mobility in server farms. That's 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 the truth. Okay, I'd like I'd like to actually move on because I think I've I've, I've uh, um, I have a little bit uh, uh, of rest. I've I've had a little bit of rest. Uh, please like this. Please like this uh, live. Please share it with your friends. We we're going to be live for uh, hopefully you know maybe not more than one hour, but I I don't believe so. So I promise this to be three hours. I'm very much on time i'll try and keep to that so so we'll we'll try and squeeze it into at least three hours maybe maybe less so i need to move on to make that happen so what's coming up next is uh fundamental terms definitions uh conditions principles and we have five more sections that you can see here so we're getting getting closer to the most interesting parts for those the more advanced, so we we this is the last basics version that we're going to have. Uh, sorry, last basics section. So license must be assigned before software is used. And this, why I have a slide on this? Why would I even bother including it? Is because license uh, when you when you think about Microsoft licensing, and not only Microsoft licensing, same applies to Oracle, the 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 famous Oracle virtualization uh, policy. Vendors want you to have enough licenses on a host or assigned to users for any potential circumstances. That is why you need to license, must license, all the authorized devices or users. Let me give you an example. You have people working from home in your organization. You have 1,000 people. And you give access to a thousand people to access some sort of server or software, desktop software on premises. You must make sure that even if they don't use it, they have the license. It doesn't matter whether they use it actively or not. You have to have them pre-licensed. Why? What if all of them one day connect at the same time to the server? There you go. So, so, so license must be assigned first, and then on, only then you have a right to use. You can't first use and then assign the license. So, where do you assign license? Actually, there are three uh, types of entities, uh, at least on premises, and the traditional license where assigned licenses, but, but they're actually two. So, let me explain. So, there are user licenses, licenses that are assigned to users, and users are so called warm bodies. I call them warm bodies. 
uh, not zombies, not robots, not service accounts, persons. A person is a user that requires a license. You need to count persons. You may, so, so that, that applies to user licenses. You may assign device licenses to devices. So, so the other type of license in the Microsoft world is a device license, and that's a computer, phone, hardware, partition, server. And when Microsoft has a definition for the server, licensed server, but if you read it carefully, basically what it says, a server is a device running server software. That's it. So, so they, they tell you that's a device. So, so in the simplified version of this slide, you may either assign licenses to users, or to hardware devices. And where, no, where, where you may know that don't assign licenses is first, virtual machines. Unless virtual machines are the cloud, because then, yes, you do assign licenses to cloud VMs. On the premises, you never assign licenses to virtual machines. And some of you who know licensing at this point will explode right now, Alex, but SQL Server, no, no. SQL Server licenses, if you, even if you license virtual machines, here, here's how it works. You calculate the requirements per the virtual machine, but you still take those licenses and assign them to the host where virtual machine runs. If you don't trust me, it's in the product terms. It's there, it's written, I'm not making this up. So yes, you do the calculations per the number of cores in the virtual machine, but you still need to assign the license to the host. So you assign it to a hardware, never to a VM. In Azure, it's a VM. In uh, in the new rules through virtual flexible virtualization on or you know in the cloud, it's going to be per VM. But normally, it's to the host. And the other thing is. There's no such thing as because because I hear this. We only need ten cows because we only maintain ten connections. You never assign licenses to connections. There's no concurrency. There's no connection metric in 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 traditional Microsoft licensing. It just does not exist. So don't assign licenses to virtual machines unless it's in the cloud, and don't assign licenses to connections. Never count those metrics. Those metrics do not exist. So let me, let me have a look at the questions because usually this 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 is a very controversial uh, uh, part. Okay, everybody's everybody's happy it seems, but anyway. <sighs> Moving on. The rule of ninety days. Uh, the slides will be available to the subscribers of the exam mailing list. The link is in the description. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not sure we're going to put it just like this, but recording will be available. And the PDF with the slides, as I said, I'll send it to the subscribers of the exam mailing list. So subscribe if you want to get a copy. Um, so, and then when I just explained to you that licenses are assigned to hosts, the next catch here is uh, that license then cannot move from that host for 90 days. It's there, it stays. If virtual machine moves, it can't just go with, with, with the virtual machine. It must stay with, uh, with the host for 90 days. But it's not that simple. So let me explain. And also, also of course, you know, I, I, get, I just had a question from a client, from our client, who came and said, can we reassign user calls from users if they left the company? Yes, you can. There are exceptional circumstances like loss of hardware, uh, user left, user died, you know, something happened to the user, temporary... Um, uh, uh, absence as well, you know, maternity leave, you may reassign a user license to a different user. You don't have to wait for 90 days. But with the, with the hardware, uh, I need to jump into virtualization and explain to you, to those who don't know virtualization. And last time I did a, did a, did a poll in our audience, in our community, and more than 50% came back uh, with the answer that they don't understand virtualization. So let me explain. So virtual machines are pretend computers with just another type of software. It makes, make, it makes, makes it look to the applications and the operating system that there's, a, there's an actual computer, but it doesn't exist. So you may have one physical computer, which, is, which we call a host. And then on that host, you may run one or many virtual machines or containers. You know, these days also containers. So uh, it's different. Licensing is different whether you run the software on, on the hardware itself, 
inside the uh, physical operating system, we call it physical operating system, although it's not physical, but it means that's running on the physical layer, on the hardware, or in that pretend computer called virtual machine. So licensing rules are different. Multiple hosts with virtual machines connected together and kind of managing the resources, moving VMs around are called virtual clusters, virtualization clusters, virtual clusters. It's a group of hosts. And here on this slide, I have a very simplistic picture. We have three hosts in the cluster. On the first host, we have two virtual machines uh, with some software, same software in all the virtual machines. And on the second host, we have, we have one machine. And on the third host, we have zero. So we have the operating systems on the host licensed with uh, uh, operating system licenses, and then the, the software licenses are still assigned to host, not to virtual machine, but equal to the number of virtual machines running on these hosts. So this is simple, two, one, zero. Should be, should be easy to understand. I tried, honestly. Sorry if I failed. But there's such a thing that is called virtual machines mobility or vMotion or VM mobility. Uh, there are other acronyms like high availability, uh, dynamic resource allocation. Basically, what it means is that in a, the whole purpose of a virtual cluster is to protect your business from resource overload on the host and the failure. So it, you know, it broke, something happened to it. Therefore, in a virtual cluster, virtual machines may move normally unless you fix them, but normally they would move. That's the whole purpose of it. So in this case, because the machines moved around, what happened is that the, now the software in the virtual machine on the third host is not licensed, and we have an extra license for that software still assigned for 90 days to the first host. So obviously, traditional licensing, the rule of 90 days does not work with virtual clusters. Did Microsoft think about it? Yes, they did. So... The rule of 90 days uh, can be overridden, overwritten with the right that is called, so I'm, it's, it's going to be difficult in the beginning, but I'll explain. License mobility in server farms. It is granted with software assurance. That's why I said a few minutes ago that to, uh, for uh, SQL Server, in a virtualized cluster, in moving virtual machines, you need software assurance. Because software assurance gives you that ability for the license to move together with the virtual machine from a host to a host without, uh, without waiting for 90 days in real time. So without software assurance, it's glued to the host for 90 days. With software assurance, it's free to move. Does it make sense? Please let me know if it doesn't. Uh, I, I have our colleague Stefan joining me. Stefan, if you want to add anything, please, please tell me in private chat. I'll bring you to the studio. So right now you're not in the studio. I can see you. Otherwise, yeah, just let me know through the private chat. Um, server farm. I have a question. Can you explain server farm? This is an important one. I didn't want to cover it. So server farm is actually a pretty large thing. It's huge. So I just showed you a cluster. Let me go back to the cluster. So cluster, this is a cluster of, 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 of hosts. Big companies will probably have like a whole data center with, I don't know, 20, 100, 200 hosts. Single location data center. They may have multiple data centers. So say they have a data center in London and they have a data center in New York. So as long as those data centers are apart, not more than four time zones, these can be called, a group of one or two data centers can be called the server farm, which means that a license with the license mobility in server farms right may move across two data centers. So server farm is, 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 is more than one data center. It's a huge, it's a huge entity. It's a big one. So software assurance gives the right to a license to actually move across time zones. There's a limitation on the number of time zones. Uh, in, the, in the EU, it's the size of the EU itself. 
but then you know there's no there's there's it's again it's a big entity so I tried i tried i hope i i didn't fail to explain it to you moving on in our presentation because we have to uh, uh keep to our promise uh how do you assign a license so, because that's that's a question we often uh, we, we say we need to assign a license, and people ask, "How do you assign a license?" So this is how you assign a license. It's not stipulated, so it's up to you. You may have a tool, Snow, ServiceNow, CMDB, any other Flixera, and then you assign a license to a computer there or to a user in that tool, and then your assign is needed. You may have an Excel spreadsheet. So, so some of our small business clients they have. Excel spreadsheets, where they basically track where they assign which license, even large clients. So I managed for for eight years, I managed a client that had a pretty huge estate. And until they deployed uh, some tool, they tracked every single SQL Server license, only for SQL Server, when they bought it, through which channel, assigned in this Excel spreadsheet to specific servers. So they, they, they were that meticulous. It's up to you. Really up to you. It's not. It's not stipulated. Can I call the server farm a collection of uh, different data centers? Yes. Yeah. Look up. So <laughs> let, let, let's do this exercise. I, I need to show you something. Really, I need to show you this because I promised you uh, to to give you to give the the basics. So if I go to to my browser and search for Microsoft, actually, yeah, I, I you know I'll type the uh, uh, URL microsoft.com licensing slash licensing slash terms. It'll take me to the product terms. Take me to the product terms. And if I go to glossary, on the left side, this glossary. Can I search for server farm here? Yeah. Server farm means a single data center or two. So two, not more data centers, each physically located either in the time zone not more than four hours apart or within the EU or EFTA. So you can call a collection of two data centers a server farm, according to this uh, definition. By the way, I encourage you, whilst we're talking about everything today, open this URL, microsoft.com slash licensing slash terms, and follow me and check everything there. And by the way, I promised you again, uh, sorry, I told you about the uh, where you can find Cal in the uh, my, uh, management license equivalency. It's still here. There's a, there's a separate uh, um, uh, point on the menu here, you know. And uh, another thing that you may check is software assurance benefits. This is where you find everything about license mobility. There are also 23 entries related to license mobility, so you can look it up. Read the details. <coughs> okay, so going back to the presentation, we need to move on. So what happens when a license expires? When you have a subscription license and it expires, you must stop using the software. Should be easy as, as pie. You don't have the right to use it anymore. You must remove it. When software assurance expires, it's a bit more difficult. So, so when you have a perpetual license that you keep forever with software runs, it expires, you don't renew it, then you must stop using the additional rights granted by software assurance. So again, I remind you, we already talked on the, about that. But what's, what's, what sort of things you have to do? You have to take licenses off cloud. You say expired, you don't have the right to deploy on the cloud anymore. You have to break virtual clusters, maybe, or do some reconfiguration, not necessarily break them. You need to buy additional license for SQL Server. If you, if you use uh, free fail, SQL failover rights, you need to buy additional licenses. You need to disable remote access to Office applications installed on service for your work from home users. You need to downgrade, and this is a killer, <laughs> you need to downgrade Windows Enterprise to Windows Enterprise LTC. It's really that bad. So. So before you even, you know, you, you, you have a call from, from your finance department saying, you know, why are we paying this Microsoft subscription? We have the licenses. Do we have the licenses? Yeah, we do have the licenses. They have personal license. Let's cancel software shows. Why are we paying this money? Well, 
it can be devastating. I've, I've, in my experience, in my career, even before some expert, you know, in 2003, 2005, I had to deal with, uh, well, software shops was introduced in 2003, but I had to deal with clients that cancel the say, and even these days, and then they uh, put themselves into a non-compliant uh, scenario. So make sure you know, understand every single thing that is impacted by canceling software shorts. <clears throat> right. Okay, multiplexing, I love that. So, uh, just recently had another conversation like this, and I can even quote, uh, why do we need a thousand user licenses if we only have a website that maintains 10 connections to a SQL Server? It's because it doesn't matter what you have in the middle. So, you may not reduce required licenses by using any sort of pooling, concurrent connection, connection pooling, middle tier applications, middle tier hardware, multi-user accounts and whatnot. If the licensing terms say you must license every user or every device, it means every client device. And if there's some, something in the middle, say one server, it still doesn't matter. No, Microsoft doesn't care. Whatever middle tier pooling you have, you still have to license the connection between the server and the very last endpoint in the chain. I'll demonstrate you now. So that what I just told you. So we have a server to which users connect somehow. You know, we, we, we don't really, it doesn't matter how they connect it. So we have six users here in this particular picture. Very simple numbers. One server, six users. That server runs, uh, say, a web application or financial application. And that financial application that is using a SQL Server database. And those of you who know, in this particular scenario, when you have six users, it's cheaper to license database per server plus user access license cards. The problem here is, if you don't understand that, uh, there will be people in the organization that will say, well, it's only one, one, one server, so we need to assign one device call to a SQL Server database. And that will be incorrect. Because first, the users don't connect just users. They, they have the devices they use to connect to that uh, SQL Server. So, so the devices that you need to count are actually the users' devices, the end users' devices. So you don't need this license. You don't even need it, by the way. But you must license every user, either with a user call or their devices with device calls. That is multiplexing. Nobody cares about what you have in the middle. What matters is the left side of the picture and the right side of the picture. That's it. Uh, downgrade rights. So funny enough, in the, in, the, in, the, in the product terms, you won't find the definition of downgrade rights, but you will find it in, uh, in the enterprise agreement, which extends product terms a little. But in product terms, if you're looking for the definition of the downgrade rights, what you need to look for is the right to use other versions. And by the way, it's now called uh, lower editions. So it used to be called right to use other version editions. And they clarified it. It's now called right to use other versions and lower editions. I need to update this slide. So in our software asset management and licensing community amongst the professionals, we use two terms. When we say downgrade, and we are, we are very precise people. When we say downgrade, we, it means version downgrade from 2019 to 2012. That is downgrade. Enterprise to standard is not a downgrade. Don't say, I need to downgrade it from enterprise to standard. That's down additioning because otherwise you're confusing. You're confusing licensing people. For IT people, you know, in that chart, chit chat's fine. But in licensing, you reduce addition from enterprise to standard. It's not downgrading. You may say downgrade edition. You may use that collocation, but don't don't say just downgrade because that's not correct. Um, so rights to use lower version, so previous version in place of uh, of the licensed one, in volume licensing, and in the majority of the CSP licenses, it just exists. It's just there. So you may assume, unless it's restricted, that you may downgrade. From, from SQL Server 2019 to SQL Server 2000. You may assume that through volume licensing channel. With online services like Office 365 and included software, 
The downgrade rights are not included. So don't assume that with online services. Assume that you don't have it unless it's explicitly permitted. So Microsoft may say in place of the current build of Office 2019, you may install Office 2016. Office 365, I mean, this, it may be granted like this. I'm not saying it is granted like this, but it may be. Look for such exceptions. So again, volume licensing, it's probably allowed. Online services, it's probably not. <laughs> any other channel, so OEM, ISV, any other channel, check the applicable terms in that channel, the ULAS and user license agreements, because there's no, there's no kind of overarching rule some software in some channels may allow you downgrading, some may not. I've seen ISV licenses that said you have to use this particular version and you're not allowed to downgrade it. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it, it's like that. So please don't assume that you can downgrade, uh, sorry, downgrade uh, online service. Please even don't assume that you can downgrade ISV or OEM licenses. Check. And then the right to use other registration when the right to use other version is sort of granted by default to all the licenses through the volume licensing at CSP, right to use lower edition must be granted to a particular product, to a particular version and particular edition. It's not automatic. For example, you may not use Office Standard under an Office Professional Plus license because down editioning or cross editioning or using a lower edition does not exist for Office Professional Plus. It doesn't. Licenses may be dependent on each other. So uh, sometimes to have a right to use a license, you may have multiple licenses. Uh, very, very, very good example is Windows Enterprise. So Windows Enterprise that you buy through volume licensing or CSP channels requires you to already have a license pre-installed on the computer, qualifying license. So without it, you don't have a right to use Windows Enterprise. You paid for it. You have the license, but you may not use it. And I have another slide to, to, uh, with other, with other uh, uh, examples. We'll get to it very soon. Licenses may be dependent on each other. So, for example, when I audit, I don't audit, we don't audit. When we help with an audit, when we, when we kind of do mock-up audit or a review of a licensing of a company, if I see that the company has more SharePoint client access licenses, say 4,000 SharePoint client access licenses, and they license SQL Server with Cal and they only have 100, I have a question. How do you license all the other users? Because if a user accesses SharePoint, SharePoint uses functionality of SQL Server, and actually, by the way, Windows Server as well. So user must be licensed to access all three types of software on this slide. So, so SharePoint Cal depends on also uh, for you to use it. Depends on also you having other Cal's for other products on this slide. So licenses may be dependent on each other. Uh, going back to licenses that you may not use, so you just said, I just said Windows Enterprise on empty laptops or upgrades without base licenses in general. So you may not use, use, a, use a new version if you only have an upgrade license. You also need a license for the base for the previous version. The other thing that is uh, really killing me, because I've seen, I've seen cases when half a million, million dollars was lost like this, is when you must, you agreed with Microsoft to purchase licenses through a specific contract, a specific channel. Say enterprise agreement, you agreed with Microsoft that for three years, all your licenses you will buy through an enterprise agreement. They will not stop you from going ahead to a different LSP and buying licenses through a different agreement. They won't stop you, why? They don't have the tools, they don't have the incentive to stop you. What will happen? You'll pay a million, and I'm not kidding, like million, million pounds, million dollars. You'll have the licenses. They'll be on your MLS, but you may not use them. They are, during the term of the enterprise agreement, because you promised to Microsoft that you will only be buying through the enterprise agreement, you can't use those licenses. So, so they, they, strictly speaking, they're dead weight, wasted money, money down the toilet. So careful. So, so not every license, even if it's a fully legal license, may actually be used. So there are, there are conditions attached to that. Uh, what time is it? I, I think we'll skip through the... Uh, I have a very difficult question, so I, you know, I'll, I'll skip through it and we'll, we'll just go in forward. 
Um, I will put uh, Daryl back into the studio. Daryl, if you want to uh, make any comments, I need, I need a breather. Sorry. Yeah, absolutely. Alex, thank you for bringing me back in. So let me just go through this, um, what we still have um, prepared for you for today. So there's quite a bit. We've got the licensing models and metrics. We're going to talk about what we call the most popular product licensing. And we're going to be diving into everything to do with Office and SQL and Windows. So we'll be touching on a higher level of that. And then for those of you that, and I think the majority of you, and it's actually interesting, I'd love to see in the chat, how many of you still manage a large on-premise environment of Office compared to Microsoft 365? So we all know that in the last four, five years, there's been a huge, huge trend towards 365. And what we're finding today, I think with the majority of our customers at least, um, enterprise organizations, that most of, their infra most of their estate is already on M365. What we do find is still a mix, but it's the unique organizations today that only have on-premise. And it's slowly but surely it's disappearing. So love to hear your opinion, how your organization works. Again, we don't know where you're from, so feel free to share the information with us. We can't backtrack your organization if you're worried about confidentiality. Um, so there's a lot to talk about Microsoft 365, and we're going to start on that. And then we're going to talk about the basics around cloud licensing and bring your own license. So I know that everybody is waiting for that session. Today, it might be the most important element of licensing that you need to know. As, as we've said, on-premise licensing is important, but it's migrating and it's transforming into online. And there's hybrid benefits and the um, ability to manage on-premise together with, with online licensing or Azure or M365 licensing is key to two very important long-term um, issues within the organization. One, it's keeping your cost under control. Everything that we talk about uh, cloud economics. So how do you keep your costs under control? How do you utilize past investments? And how do you maximize your bring your own license uh, uh, abilities? That's one. And two, and it's still important, compliance. So if five, six, seven years ago, the discussion around compliance was almost on a daily basis, it's, it's faded. It's faded slightly. It's not in the main consensus and um, focus of Microsoft and organizations, but still, Audits are still happening, and your only concern about compliance, as we all know, is when you have an audit. So it's not, again, I don't want to underestimate the importance of compliance and audits, yet an audit drives compliance. Organizations find it very difficult on an ongoing basis to manage their compliance. So I always say keep that in mind as the second most important issue on the table and always try and revisit that on an ongoing basis. Don't forget that they still happen. The last subject for today is license, licensing agreements, and Alex will touch on the basics. There are so many different licensing agreements out there today that um, everybody is very um, focused on CSP, and of course, Microsoft Enterprise Agreement is, is the key licensing vehicle for enterprise customers for the last 15 to 20 years. Yet there are additional benefits or additional options out there that you need to be aware of. And I think that one of the best practices, and I know we're still in the basics, but one of the best practices around licensing these days or licensing agreements these days is mix and match. So there are best um, practices around how to utilize your EA together with your enterprise agreement, together with ISV, um, licensing together with maybe your SPLA. So a lot of options out there. Alex is going to talk about them all. And again, we're going to leave you with those basic 
elements of understanding how to manage an estate. Again, you won't remember all the details, but the concepts are what the concepts are it's important. important. We we, yeah. we Alex, want to please. give you today. We want to give you the concepts today instead of nitty gritty details. We will cover nitty gritty details. So stay subscribed to our channel. Come back more often. You know, subscribe to our LinkedIn page. Watch our events. We will publish uh, videos dedicated to the most popular products. We, we, you know, it's impossible to cover the entire Microsoft stack. You know, like I'm, I'm not sure if anybody is even interested in a, in a huge uh, video talking about licensing Microsoft Kazala. Maybe you do, by the way. Let me know. But, but things like Windows Server, SQL Server, Azure licensing, uh, Office 365. We're going to have dedicated videos. We already have them from the last year, but it's good time for them to be updated because lot, lot, a lot is changing on the 1st of October. So I have I want to pick up one question. So how do how to account with the user access licensing to, uh, for a um, uh, large number of users from the internet? So that depends per product. So let me give you a few examples. Windows Server, if you have something, say a website running on IIS, on Windows Server, typical Windows Server, not Windows Server Web, you will need external connectors. Instead of cows, you will have to assign to all the hosts, I'm not saying VMs, hosts, you need to assign one external connector, Windows Server external connector, per hardware device. So if you have a farm of 10 servers with a couple of web, web, web servers, <laughs> this is a licensing trickery here. So because Windows Server external connectors have uh, license mobility rights. So in, in the case when with only two VMs looking externally, indirectly as well, in, in the, it, it's very important. If there's, a, if there's another VM with a SQL Server database, you need to count it too. So let's say, okay, fine, we have three virtual machines in a 10 host cluster. You can either buy 10 external connectors for each host without software assurance or three external connectors with software assurance by the number of virtual machines, by the maximum number of the hosts that they may spread across. So that's for Windows Server. SQL Server doesn't have external connectors. If you want to run an application that serves data from a SQL Server to the internet, you use the licensing model per core SQL Server. You can flip. You can either choose to license it per server and, and, and access licenses or per core. And in that case, you don't need to count access licenses. So, so for such scenarios, you just basically select those applicable licensing models per product. And products like Exchange, for the basic functionality, it doesn't require external connectors or, or styles for external use, only for the basic functionality though. SharePoint doesn't. Skype for Business doesn't. So if they're external. There you go. So, so there are specific licensing, uh, either licensing options or licensing requirements. But, but what... Again, what's important is that unless you know that there's such an exception, you need to assume, like you did, and thank you for that, that you need to think about that. Uh, okay. <clears throat> Moving on. Microsoft licensing models and metrics, just the overview. So, so please note, we only cover today the current licensing metrics, uh, and we, we won't touch on historic ones. And uh, SPLA is vastly different, so don't apply this. This knowledge, which, which, which we'll just acquire in, in, the, in the next slides, don't apply it to SPLA. SPLA is like a completely different world. So we, we, have a, we have a training for SPLA, but it's premium. We're not going to publish it on YouTube. <coughs> And by the way, if you if you are a provider, if you're interested in an SPLA training, let me know. This is the only sales message that I'm going to send today. So for SPLA providers, we have a specific four-hour long or even six-hour long training that covers everything, like every single aspect. What is the metric? Something measurable using which you can calculate how many licenses you need and how much it is going to cost you. So how, how do you count that? You need to count the licenses required. You need the metric. The metrics can be users, number of users, number of devices, can be number of instances, can be number of processes, can be number of processor cores, and even crazy metrics like in power, power apps as applications per user. You know, how do you track that? Uh, but the basics are users, devices, instances, processors, cores. So that's 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 the classics. Uh, and some some in some cases users are easy to count, they're persons. 
with cores, it may be difficult because, say, to license uh, an instance of Windows Server, you may need to cover every single core. So there are formulas based on metrics, how you calculate required licenses. That's, that's a metric. So uh, software license per user, these days, uh, if you are a new company or you've migrated to Microsoft 365 and Azure, some of the Azure services are per user and online services like Microsoft 365, unless exception, unless there are exceptions. Microsoft 365 is usually per user. I have only seen once Microsoft 365, a license per device in a government organization, something like it. It's, it's it was a it was a it was an exception. Let me put it like this. So uh, when online services license per user have uh, also software included, the number of local instances may be limited. So pay attention to that. There may be limitations. For example, like five local installs only, and you can't have six or more. Device limitations may apply, and I have uh, 10 uh, point one inch here. I actually updated the other slide already, so let me update this one. So, so now, now, the limit has been raised to 10.9 inches. Not much. Uh, I wonder why. So, certain certain user licenses may uh, not allow you to use a device with more than 10.9 inches uh, size screen. <clears throat> it's. Uh, uh, so Carl is saying 10.4, I think it's 10.9, but anyway, check product terms. It's been recently increased slightly. So again, pay user licenses is usually Microsoft 365. You just count the required person's users that require specific packages of M365 or components, and you assign those licenses to users. Traditional software like Office uh, Project and Visio is licensed per device. And what's important here, it's not licensed per device where that software is installed. It's licensed per device that has access to that software. And then any user of that licensed device may access that software from that licensed device. Why I say access? Let me explain that because that needs to be explained still, you know, after so many years because it's been it's been it's been ongoing for years and years and years. So when you have a local copy on a device, I shouldn't have arrows here. Basically, say there's there's a laptop that is shared by six people. There's a there's a license for not for Office 365 for Office say Office standard on that device. Any user of that device may use that office because it's licensed on that device. One license. It's a device license. Simple. But when we're talking about work from home situation, you may have office installed in a virtual server or a VDI, virtual, uh, client virtual machine, you know, if you don't know what VDI is. Somewhere in the office, there is a server to which you connect uh, through the internet using VPN, for example, or Citrix, if you know what it means. And from home, you access that server and you use Office standard on it. In that case, you need to license every client device that has access to that server. You don't need to license the copy that is on the server. Because again, device license means that you need to license devices that connect and use the software. And uh, good luck managing that. <laughs> it's almost impossible. And uh, Microsoft still, uh, because they want to push Office 365, they don't want to uh, introduce per user licensing for traditional Office. For that particular reason, they want to sell Office 365. You want that sort of flexibility, use Office 365. So you need to license for the worst case for all the potential devices. How do you manage that? As I said, it's almost unmanageable, but that, that the rule is the rule. There are some licenses that give you ability to choose some products, to choose whether you want to license them per, per device or per user or even mix and match. And one of them is virtual desktop access. Without going into the details of what it means, I just, I just give it as, as an example, if you know what it is. You may, if you if you license it per device, then any user from a licensed device may use that functionality. If you license it per user, then, then the licensed user may use any devices. So it's up to you. You just choose the most economic version. These days, 
in in regular organizations, I'm not talking about uh, factories or retail, consulting companies, you know, uh, IT companies, usually you have fewer users than devices. In that case, you will probably choose the per-user licensing model because it just costs you less. And you don't have to micromanage every single device. If, if a product gives you such a choice, choose wisely. Desktop operating systems. So these days, Windows 11 is extremely complicated because the licenses that you get with uh, through volume licensing channels and CSP are addition upgrades. So you upgrade from professional to enterprise or from, yeah, from professional to enterprise. Let's not overcomplicate this. And they require qualified operating systems to come pre-installed. The problem with that is that <laughs> plans like, the most popular plans like E3 and E5, they're per user. And Windows 11 that you get in E3 and E5 is per user, but it requires qualified licenses that are per device. It's, it's to, to me, if, if you ask me what exactly do I hate the most in Microsoft licensing, it's Windows 11 licensing. Because it's, Microsoft is simplifying it right now, so some of the things will be simpler, but not all of them, from the 1st of October. Uh, another licensing model, basic licensing model that you need to uh, know, and I've touched on it, and I hope if you, if you have been patient enough and out of five plus hundred, we still have 350 people online, so thank you for staying with us. I think you're waiting, all waiting for the cloud part. So uh, if you still didn't understand when I said about you need to license a server and, and, and access, that's the exact licensing model that I'm going to explain right now. So, so things like Exchange, SharePoint, Skype for Business, and as an option, SQL Server, because SQL Server can choose either one or another licensing model. They, uh, so, so, and SharePoint Exchange and Skype for Business, they, they don't, don't give you that choice. So you have to license them only this way. You pay for each instance, for an instance license. And then you also have to license either users connecting to those servers or devices. And don't forget about external connections, which are, for these products, in the current versions, don't require any external licensing. So, so you only need to license internal users with cars. So again, server license, internal users, car per user per, per device, and external users, external connector is included. But for, ex for Exchange, if they use enterprise functionality, sorry, they require cars. So a bit complicated. And I say, when I say a bit, I'm being sarcastic. Um, the core thing, if you have remove complications, is that in this licensing model, you need both server licenses and car licenses. And this slash is a bit misleading. That's why I call it server plus cal when I talk to my clients. Let's talk about hardware metrics. So processes and cores is just a bit of a bit of history. So in the beginning, there were server licenses. You know, all, all the software, all the vendors, almost all the vendors, they just had server licenses. So you had a server, you, you needed one license. It was easy. It was easy. But, but then the processes were cores didn't exist. They were just single core processes as we call them these days. So how did you scale? You want more functionality, you buy more service, hardware service, and then uh, you know you need more, more power, you, you buy more service. And therefore, you buy more licenses. Then at some point, uh, the producers of the uh, regular hardware uh, learned how to install multiple processes in service. Therefore, well, you don't need that many servers to scale. And then the vendors thought, oh, we're losing money. That's exactly what happened. So yeah, bear with me. And then decide, okay, fine, let's charge them per processor. Let's, let's uh, redo licensing of certain products from instances or servers to per processor. Now to license each of the servers on the left side on the slide, you need to assign two processor licenses, not one server license, two processor licenses. Uh, but that the history didn't stop there. So as I said, several processor licenses uh, are now required. And in some cases, by the way, there were minimums. So for example, on a one process server, you still had to assign two processes, two processor licenses. So they did that. Uh, the 
Core didn't stop there, and then the clever producers of hardware, uh, Intel and you know other processor uh, manufacturers, they decide, you know what, instead of pushing like eight, 16 processors into one server, can we create processors on the processor? Basically, uh, processors running simultaneously in one, in, one, in one processor box, and they call them cores. So these are cores. So processors may have multiple cores, and these days, every processor has multiple cores. And then again, now, several core licenses are required, and there may be minimums, depending on the uh, product. So, for example, Windows Server requires you to assign at least 16 core licenses to the server or more. So you need to count all the cores. If it's less than 16, you need to assign 16. So there are minimums. That's, that, that's, that's the metric called processor core. Uh, virtual machines have virtual processor, virtual cores, rather, these days. They're basically just you know, mapping out the functionality of physical cores to virtual cores. That, that's what you count. That's what your uh, uh, inventory software reports you that the virtual machine has four V cores. That's your licensing matrix, virtual cores, four virtual cores in that virtual machine. Hope, I hope it's, it's uh, something uh, you, you understand. So SQL Server gives you, as I said, a choice between server cow, which where you buy uh, server licenses per instance, sorry, not per instance, per operating system environment. It's important. SQL is an interesting beast. Anyway, per server, let's let's call it this way. You buy you buy license per server, and then you need to license access. That's your choice. If, on the other hand, you have a lot of users or devices, you can't control them, you have internet access, we recommend choosing the per core licensing model where you license it counting the cores of either physical service or virtual machines. And then you um, don't have to license access. You just license the cores. So no cows in that particular model per core. These days, you cannot buy SQL Server Enterprise that is licensed per server cow. Server, server cow for new licenses is only uh, accessible to SQL Server Standard Edition. Enterprise, if you buy a new license these days, it will be per core. There's no option. There's no other option. So you have to, you have to pay per core. Right. Uh, <clears throat> In the server car model, don't choose it when you have external uh, users because there are no external connectors. You still have to license them with cows. And how do you manage that? Like one of the audience who asked that question just, just recently. In the per core licensing model, the, the licensing rules, are, uh, the basic licensing rules are pretty simple. So you need to assign, when you, when you, when you run SQL Server in the, the physical operating system, you need to assign at least four cores per each processor. In the virtual machine, there's a minimum of four virtual core licenses, core licenses per virtual machine. So for example, if you have a virtual machine with only two cores, it still requires four licenses. If you have a virtual machine with six cores, it requires six. So the, the number of cores in the virtual machine, but not less than four. Hope you understand it. That's, the, that's kind of the, the basics of the SQL Server per core licensing model. Um, virtualization in per core model. So standard edition, if, if you have virtual machines, you will count per virtual machine in that, uh, in that license scenario. Enterprise edition licenses allow you to either license enterprise edition and standard edition, by the way, virtual machines as well, because it has dial edition rights, per virtual machine, or you have a choice to assign only, it only works with SQL Server Enterprise, to assign SQL Server Enterprise licenses to the hardware level, to the physical layer, and then run as many virtual machines as, as, as you want, but that requires those licenses to, to have software assurance. That's called SQL Server Unlimited Virtualization. So you, so you have a choice. You cannot do that with standard. You can't assign standard edition cores to the hardware and then run virtual machines with standard. That's not allowed. <clears throat> that's, that's too long. No, it's not long, Alonso. It's, uh, it's, it's fine. I mean, I, I promised you three hours. Bear with me. Okay, so. Uh, and it's only, it's only the basics. <laughs> Remember, it's only the basics. Um, so, how they sold. Uh, importantly, don't uh, so, so, so licensing requirements must be calculated in single cores, but you buy them in two core packs. 
So if you need 40 cores, you'll buy 20 bucks. It's important to understand. So when, 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 when it's not the same thing. Always ask how the calculation was performed in single cores or in core packs. And with SQL, it's not that dangerous. With Windows Server, I'll touch on that. It's, it's quite dangerous if you don't understand it. So Windows Server, which I just said, uh, the licensing model, again, is different. My Windows Server is per core Pascal. So you have to count cores and you have to count clients. Yeah, how, how cool is that? So <laughs> Windows Server, right now, until the 1st of October, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you a bit of uh, insight of what's going to happen the 1st of October. Right now, it's only licensed at the physical level. Whether for just standalone physical service or virtual service, you, you assign licenses, account licenses based on the number of physical processes in the box. Physical cores, sorry. There are two minimums. I'll show you the pictures with, with, with you know, I'll demonstrate you how minimums work. And again, virtual machines are licensed at the physical uh, uh, level. Users and devices, you have a choice of either user cars or device cars, or you can mix and match if you want, if that works for you. And for external users, there are external connectors assigned per hardware host or a server, standalone server. So here's how minimums work. So there's a minimum of eight cores per CPU. So if your CPU has one core, like in the first picture, you know, you still still need to assign at least eight, but actually you need to assign at least 16 because there's the second minimum, which is 16 core licenses per server. So a server may never have less than 16 licenses assigned to it. Uh, and here's another example. So, so for example, uh, on top of, the, uh, of, of this, we have a server with four single core processors. Because there's a minimum of eight cores, you still need to assign 32 cores. It doesn't matter that you only have, you know, you only have four cores in total in the server. You need to assign 32 because there's a minimum per process. And servers like uh, at the bottom, 120 core server, it's easy because you are above all the minimums. It's just a number of number of cores. So I hope that makes makes sense. Um, Virtualization. So Windows Server right now has no licensing mobility, but it will it will get flexible virtualization on the first of October. So right now, until until it gets it, until until that sets that is set in stone and written in product terms, it doesn't exist. So right now, standard edition. If you license the entire, uh, following all the minimum minimums and all the rules, the entire server with Windows Server standard cores, you may run up to two virtual machines. You want more virtual machines, license it again. So you assign another layer of licenses, it gives you right for two more virtual machines. Another layer of licenses, two more virtual machines. But after that number crosses about seven virtual machines, data center edition becomes less expensive. It makes more sense because then you assign data center edition licenses and run as many virtual machines as you want. It's unlimited. <coughs> okay. Okay. So core licenses, and here's something that I, I, I have a, I have a, an article and a video, and it makes me swear all the time when I hear this, when somebody says 16 core license. There's no 16 core license. There's no red core license. There's no two core license. A license is always single core. Compliance, if you get audited, is always calcul calculated in single cores. Your, your licensing entitlement in the VLSC will be in single cores again. So it's all, it's all about single cores. Product terms talks about single cores. There is no but. So, so the licenses are sold in packs. What is a pack? A pack is a, a pack is a pack of batteries. I don't know if I can open this pack very quickly. I'll try. Here's a pack. It's not a license. It's a. This is a license. This is a license. This is. A, you know, each of these are separable single licenses, and this is a pack. So six, there's no sixteen core, core license. Why it's important? I mean, I mean, you may think, I mean, who cares? Well, here's the thing. If you assign a 16-core uh, pack to Azure, you may run up to two virtual machines under one pack. Some people say, no, 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 you can't. If you assign one 16-core pack, it only gives you right to one machine because you can't break it. Don't even think packs and breaking or dividing. Don't even put it in one sentence because it doesn't make any sense. You have licenses. You bought them in the package, fine. You can break them between the servers. 
There's a minimum of 16, but okay. There's another example. Two servers with 24 cores. 48 cores in total. If you think that you cannot break licenses, uh, sorry, sorry, packs, then in that case, you would have to assign 46 uh, uh, cores, but you have to assign 48, to, sorry, 64. Not 64, 48, because, because you need 16 minimum, and then you need more, eight more, and then to the other server, you need 16 minimum, another, another eight, you just need three packs. Right, moving on. Please remember that. System center, so the only reason I have it here, it's, this is a bit more advanced, but system center, what I need to understand is this, this is the opposite of client licensing. So you don't license the service, you license the endpoints. So your server is here, it manages endpoints, it manages clients or service, you license the service, almost like cows, but they're called management licenses. So system center is more, is more or less that paradigm, but when, it's, when, when you manage servers, when you manage those endpoints as servers, the licensing model is very similar to Windows, Windows Server Core, so you count the cores exactly the same way. Right, let's not, I mean, it's, it's a big subject where, you know, we'll have that much time. So, Visual Studio is, is an interesting one. Uh, when I see an ALP that says, we found 25 instances of Visual Studio, therefore we need 25 licenses, that is bollocks, that's incorrect. Because what you need to count is the users that use those 25 instances of software, and it may be one user that decided to install it 25 times, and that's absolutely fine. Or it may be a hundred users. Because Visual Studio, Microsoft Desktop, sorry, Microsoft Developer Tools are licensed per named, or they call designated, but named user. So person, they're licensed per person. Uh, they may only be used, they may only be used for development, test, demonstration, and design. Nothing else. Not in production. Don't deploy them in production. They're not allowed to be deployed in production environments. <clears throat> so every person... So, okay, with MSDN, there's another catch because sometimes you may have a team of 50 people and only 10 of them are developers and there are 40 you know, backup operators, uh, sysadmins, and all of them have access to... Develop to the development sandbox. So all of them require licenses. Not only the users that use uh, MSDN and deploy these products, but also those who support them, help them to deploy them. So everybody who's touching MSDN software, development software, needs a license for that software. So that's important. Everyone who has access to non-production environments must be somehow licensed. There aren't, there are, uh, uh, you know, nitty-gritty details there, but, but just remember that because we had issues with auditors. When auditors discovered that there are many more users than just MSDN subscribers that have access to a non-production environment. User access, user access, test access, so it's UAT access from users. When you say, please test my application, that does not require license, but sysadmins require, they do. Sysadmins still require that. Okay, uh, let's move on. Uh, here's a question for you, and I'll take a, take a breather, and I hope Daryl can help me and, and overtake. Uh, <clears throat> Your IT department wants to procure laptops with pre-installed Linux operating system because it's cheaper than with Windows, but plans to image them with Windows Server Enterprise. What do you think? Is it a good idea? Or is it the wrong idea? Daniel, do you want to take over? Because oh, I, I need I need a bit of a. Oh, he's disconnected. Sorry. So yeah, I'll have to stay with you. <laughs> yeah, it is a, it is a wrong idea. Thank you for your answers. So obviously, you know, you have to have uh, Windows um, uh, Windows OEM pre-installed before you image these lines, this this computers with Windows Enterprise. Linux won't do. Linux won't do. So coming up next, we have three uh, new sections that we didn't have last year, uh, which uh, will be. I'll try and keep them short because I've only got one hour left. And there are exactly 60 slides, actually 50 slides. Uh, so I think we can do that. We can make it. So uh, Microsoft 365 basics, just basics, just the basics. So Microsoft 365 is a bundle that has multiple plans, multiple various plans from which you may choose. 
under Microsoft 365 umbrella, there are three other sort of bundles. Windows 11 is not really a bundle, so it's just Windows 11. But Office 365 is a bundle in itself. It has components which can be bought. Some of them may be purchased separately. EMS, Enterprise Mobility and Security, which is the third component of Microsoft 365, may also be broken down into, into sub-components. So I have a link on this uh, slide, which is Microsoft m365maps.com. I encourage you to go to that site. I have no idea who maintains it, but I love that person. Because there's no advertisement. They don't even tell who they are, but they maintain an up-to-date map in various formats of all the Microsoft 365 plants, components, subcomponents, packages, everything, all the features there. So if, if you have any questions about Microsoft 365 plants, this is this is this is the best way, the best place to look up exactly what particular details you need. And why why you need this? Because well, first of course you can break it down to components, but also you need to understand whether a specific plan is a good fit for you, whether you're paying too much or you're not getting the functionality. And here's a good, uh, um, I'm not going to go in every single detail of every single plan, but here's a good illustration of why and how different Microsoft 365 packages, and this is not the entire list, by the way, so I don't have academic uh, plans here, how they may differ. Uh, for example, client apps are not included in F1 and F3. You won't get Office installed on, on, on the desktop. Uh, shared computer activation is vital for you to deploy uh, Office 365 applications in a work-from-home or remote desktop scenario. You have to have plans with shared computer activation. So, therefore, you may not use business basics or business standard in, in that scenario. I don't remember exactly about business premium. I may be wrong. I think it does have shared computer activation, and, and it's a mistake on this slide. This is how complex that is. There may be user limits. So, 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 so plan ahead. If your company is more than, you know, is, is, is going to grow over 300 users, maybe business plans are not for you. And on the uh, field worker plans, there's a limitation on, on the primary device screen. So if, if they use larger screens, they just may not, by the terms of the license, be assigned F1 and F3 licenses. Sorry, this is how Microsoft complicates it. Good question. Sorry. I, I, well, let's go back to MSDN. I assume sysadmins won't need an MSDN license to perform these duties as they are covered with the data center license and user costs. No, it's not. It's not correct. So, so, so if you have a, a dedicated development environment where all the software is licensed purely with MSDN, then they need MSDN licenses. If they only maintain virtual machines with purely Windows Server, and in that development environment, that Windows Server is still licensed with production licenses, you decide that so, then, 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 then that will be correct. So again, multiple moving parts. But if they deploy a virtual machine and maintain it and back, back it up, you know, roll out patches that has SQL Server in it, which is licensed through MSDN or SQL, uh, you know, any, any sort of Visual Studio subscription, then they have to have licenses to access that machine through MSDN. So, yeah, it, it, it really depends on how your licensing of your development environment is, is, uh, is designed. So you have to have a very good licensing design. Otherwise, assume that everyone, and Microsoft even has lots of articles uh, on that matter explaining this, good articles and white papers. Assume that everyone who even helps developers to develop. When they touch that, they need a license. Right. Let's move on. Back to M365. So why it's, again, why it's so important is that the way to uh, reduce costs and, and plan your you know, e economics of, of your Microsoft 365, you need to understand whether you need all these packages. Unless they, they've been pushed to you or, you know, your, your CEO happily, you know, runs into the office and says, I've just signed a fantastic deal with Microsoft under which we get like 80% discount on Microsoft E5. Well, I guess you have no choice. But if you're given a task to uh, to optimize your uh, costs, I'm not necessarily saying reduce, optimize, reshuffle the costs, then you need to plan your personas. You need to plan your personas. You need to assess your users. 
check what roles they uh, they play in the organization. What are their primary devices? What are their usage patterns? Uh, what do you think they need? And importantly, what they do actually need? Because, well, you, have, you can get uh, reports from your SAM tool, from Office 365, and then actually check whether they use something or they don't. So, uh, and that's how you plan your personas. And then you choose the right package. Or maybe even you you look at the price list with somebody's help and find out that a particular persona, a particular user configuration in your company, in your organization, does not need the entire package, and it's cheaper just to buy them a few components, like Exchange Online and nothing else. So this is how you do it. Importantly with Office 365 is, is to really manage the costs of it. You need to uh, look at almost in real time, or at least once a month, at your usage patterns. Because what we find is that across across our clients, there are users that are, and this is this is the simplified diagram, that are leavers still holding on to a license. They, they have a license assigned. They left the company. Microsoft doesn't automatically unassign license. You have to do it yourself. You have to have a script or a manual process. Microsoft gave you um, an option to assign automatically. They didn't give you an option to unassign. Why wouldn't they? Uh, inactive users that have a license, but they don't use it, or they don't use certain components of it, maybe they can be downgraded. And there may be unassigned licenses that you're paying for, and we see this again across all the clients. So, so I have a metric that is called uh, Office 365 or Microsoft 365 usage efficiency or licensing efficiency, which is a very simple uh, ratio of active users to the number of licenses. And normally, when the environment is untouched, it may be different in various organizations, but normally it's around 75%. So 25%, if it's unmanaged, 25% of the money paid for Microsoft 365 packages is completely wasted. So pay attention to that. You may use consumption reports in your Office 365 portal and just check there. They're quite complex, but you can learn to read them. There are tools available to interpret them. If you're an advanced user and you want to go really nitty gritty, there's a Graph API. You can download even more detailed usage, you know, usage, usage logs. Who used which component when? You know, what what sort of what they activate? What how many emails they send? That sort of level of detail. And then talk, work with a cloud economics analyst to help you massage this, to help you maintain it. So it's 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 important. Um, moving on. Coming up next. <laughs> Cloud licensing and bring your own license. Uh, Stefan, can you join me, please? Because I don't see you in the uh, in the um, audience. So uh, I, I'll still lead, but 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 uh, you know, Stefan is our uh, I would call associate partner. Uh, <laughs> yes, yeah. Let's let's put I'm it this junior. way. Uh, <laughs> cloud cloud economics. Uh, the head of cloud economics and some expert. Hopefully, you know we we're working on that. Yeah. So so you don't be surprised when we have a like a huge. Funfair announcement that you know, Stefan joined some experts. So, but he's with us today for the first time in, in the live uh, event. And we are already, we have recorded and we are editing videos around Azure hybrid use benefits and, and Azure, Azure economics. So please follow, you know, subscribe to the channel. There's going to be a series of videos talking about, and he's, he's even, he talks even more than I do. So, yeah, he knows a lot. Yeah, so, uh, I, do you know this is actually my maiden voyage streaming? It's the first time ever I'm live on the internet. Ever. <laughs> Are you? Good. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Get, get, get used to it. You'll get a lot with us. So, yeah. uh, what the, the important message for everybody, let me move on because we need to, we need to finish it uh, at six uh, my time. Uh, the important message here is uh cloud uh, but bring your own licenses are changing so we will talk about the changes now because you, it's inevitable it's soon so you need to know about them and all the changes I, i'll flag them the slides unless i forgot with yellow so everything that's yellow will be in effect on october uh, 1st 2022 the information we have is preliminary we don't have access and we can't even we, if we did we don't have access to confidential information but I have very I have very good sources that kind of suggest certain things, and we've been in licensing for so many years. You may trust me. Ninety nine percent of what we're going to say today 
will probably materialize exactly as we say it today. So th this is all a bit of speculation. We're not disclosing any confidential info, but we're very much on point, I'm pretty sure. So <laughs> watch that space, you know, uh, and then we'll see how, uh, how, uh, uh, how good we are at predictions. So if you're watching this recorded, and lots of you will be watching this recorded, the previous training like this was watched 20,000 times, only, only like, I think it was 1,500 times during the live, and, and, and in total, almost 20,000 times after that. So uh, you check for the updates on our website, on someexpert.com, obviously. Check the updates and product terms. Go to product terms and read the updated terms and conditions after the 1st of October. Right, so cloud bring a license fundamentals. We're going to give you fundamentals. We're going to give you like the right mindset. Some Microsoft licenses, not all of them, some Microsoft licenses may be taken to the cloud. It does make sense. You take them to the cloud, you stop paying pay as you go rates. It reduces your cloud expenses and you already paid for the license. In uh, most cases, a very good question from Elvin in the chat. Can you bring this up? Because this is exactly spot on to the slide which you're showing right now, and I would like to answer this. Is this one? Hello. Is it this one? If I have a... exactly, exactly. So AWS is a bit of a special case. In AWS, you basically need to buy a higher fee VM, which charges you more per hour, in order for you to be allowed to run Windows Server or any of the Microsoft products. It's a little different in the Azure world where you can bring your existing licenses. This is this Azure hybrid use benefit or Azure hybrid benefit. Some people abbreviated that we talked about. So basically in AWS, it's one of the listed providers we are going to talk about in just a second. But it means that yeah, you have to get a license from AWS. You cannot bring your own one. And this is basically um, creating a advantage for Microsoft in their own cloud. Good right. Okay. Okay. So. 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 Okay. L l may I simplify this, please? Because I. I. I warned you. Stefan knows a lot, and he can be a bit <laughs> geeky. I will simplify this. So, if you have a Windows Server or SQL, uh, probably Windows Server Plus SQL Server on AWS, do I pay for a license, or it's part of AWS? If you go to the AWS portal and without assigning, bringing your own licenses, any anything like that, you just buy virtual machines with SQL from them. You pay SPLA fees, SPLA. So, so they pay for your license and they charge it back to you. They pay for it to Microsoft and they charge it back to you. That's how it works. You may, though, bring your licenses, and I'll talk about it how, we're going to be talking about it, to AWS, and thus reduce the cost that you pay to AWS, but you have to tell them. So, so the question the question is always in the, de the, 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 the devil's own, I don't like you know saying that, but the trick is in the details, let me say it this way. Uh, because some VMs may not allow you to bring your own licenses, so you, you, need to, you need to see which configurations allow you to bring your own licenses. But, but in general, you, at the moment, you may not bring your Windows Server licenses to AWS. You will be able from the 1st of October. And at the moment, you, you already may bring your SQL Server licenses to AWS, subject to them allowing you to do so. Microsoft does. Microsoft allows you to do so. So, okay, let me remove that. So... <clears throat> As I said, in most cases, to do so, to bring these licenses, software assurance, or an equivalent subscription is required. Not all providers are equal. So we, we, we'll cover them in the couple of the next, you know, I think in two slides from now. So not all providers are equal. Various providers allow various bring your own license rules. They're kind of like stuck. And then single tenant or, so you need to remember that if you step into the bio area. So single tenant, uh, which is also called dedicated, which is also called single user, which is also called rented hardware. So there's a hardware that you rent for yourselves. Nobody else's virtual machines run on that hardware. That is treated almost as your own premises. No, again, not on every provider, but, but that's the default thing that you need to understand. It's different. When it's multi-tenant, so, so the provider owns the hardware and various VMs run there. You have no control. It's what's it's what called private cloud. You really don't know where exactly your VM is. Those bring your own licenses, uh, bring your own licenses terms are different to dedicated. So we have differences in, in uh, which licenses may be brought to, to the cloud. We need to know and understand that. 
we need to understand what sort of provider we're dealing with, and we need to understand whether we're deploying this to single tenant, to ours, you know, dedicated to us hardware, or to a private, cl- to a public cloud. All right. So, not all licenses are equal. That's the first point. So, basically, Microsoft licenses may be put in two buckets: pay once and pay forever. It's it's a bit cheeky. I did it did it on purpose. When I say pay once, I mean licenses that you buy and then you don't pay any subscription fees later. No subscriptions, no software assurance. Uh, two types. The so-called license-only licenses in volume licensing and the perpetual licenses in CSP. They, in general, you may only bring them to a dedicated hardware and not on every provider. Other restrictions may apply. So it depends. So in general, it's it's almost like on-premises. So you can't take them to public cloud. You know, if you don't pay Microsoft a monthly fee, if you don't if they don't get recurring money from you, you can't take licenses to a public cloud infrastructure, only to dedicate it. And that's what I call pay forever. So whether you pay for software assurance consistently and it expires, you have to remove the licenses, or you pay for CSP subscriptions. So subscription licenses through CSP. In that case. You may take them, and again, depending on the provider environment and other terms and conditions, you may take them and bring them to uh, 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 to the cloud. So some products are currently eligible for bring your own license granted by license mobility through software assurance, and that's that's kind of more broader, right? That allows you to bring them to various kinds of providers, not all of them, but but more. And there's a more uh, restricted term. Right, which is called Azure Hybrid Use Benefit. That is obviously in its name, it has Azure. So through that right, you may only take them to Azure. And until October 1st, which is in two weeks from now, you may only take CSP subscriptions to Azure, not to any other provider. From October 2022, you'll you'll be able to take them to almost any um, public cloud environment. Through flexible virtualization, which is upcoming, it's not yet it's not yet defined in Microsoft product terms. We only see the initial preliminary um, announcements about it. Now, as I said, not all providers are equal. So so, so in Microsoft terms, there are two types of providers. There, there's, a, there's, a, there's a more nitty-gritty division, but, but in general, we have listed providers aside from all the others. And listed providers on this side. Listed providers include entities identified by Microsoft on this page. Alibaba, Amazon, AWS, Google GCP, and Microsoft Azure. So they have more, much more restricted bring your own license rules, except for Azure, that has uh, unfair competition advice. I'm sorry, I'm, you know, I hope I hope nobody's going to sue me for saying this. But uh, going back a little bit, so uh, all the rest of the providers in the product terms are called authorized outsourcers, really. So any third-party service provider that is not a listed provider is an authorized outsourcer. That's it. Simple as that. Um, so authorized outsourcer, basic. We normally, between ourselves, also call them SPLA providers because if they if they host Microsoft software, they have to have an SPLA agreement. So we, that's why we call them SPLA providers. But they're just just any hosting provider with Microsoft software. So if 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 they uh, rent you out dedicated hardware which is dedicated to your use hardware, not virtual machines, because some people just you know mix it up. Oh, we have virtual machines dedicated to us. That doesn't matter. You have to have hosts dedicated to you. In that case, bring your own license is quite easy. On authorized outsources, you may almost bring any license, both anywhere, without a say, with a say. It doesn't, it's almost like your own on-premises hardware. There are a few limitations, very few limitations, but, but in general, it's as simple as that. It's your hardware. You rent it. It's it's. Uh, you, if you look at product terms, it's called. It, hardware must be dedicated to your own use. That's it. And then they have public cloud, so multi-tenant hardware. So, on multi-tenant hardware in authorized outsources, do please don't assume that you can bring your own license to any authorized outsource because they require additional outsources, so additional authorization to uh, bring your license to, to that provider. So if you say, if you rent VMs from, from a provider called, I don't know, um, Contessa, I'll use the Microsoft's generic term, and that's the provider. And you heard that through license mobility, you can take your SQL Server license to a provider. You must check that they are authorized for you to, to allow you to bring 
license to them. I'll, I'll touch on this. We'll, we're getting there. I'll explain. So don't assume if they're unauthorized outsourcer, you can just take a license and bring it to a public uh, cloud infrastructure in any provider. And then you must undergo a license verification process. So again, it's not an automatic process. You must actually ask Microsoft permission to take licenses and bring them to a certain provider. And Microsoft must grant you that permission first. Before that, so actually you have 10 days from your deployment to get that permission. And after that, if they don't give you that permission, you're non-compliant, sorry. And, and the provider is non-compliant too, but that's not the matter for today's presentation. So when I said that not even not authorized outsourcers are equal, that's, don't assume that you just, you know, you may automatically bring your license. So right now until 1st of October, Products with license mobility may only be brought to providers with a license mobility partner authorization. License mobility partners. You, you, Google, you know, there's a list. You, you Google it, and there's a PDF with, with a list of license mobility partners. If you want to deploy Windows 11 or Office 365 applications with a provider, they must have an, even, even a higher level of authorization, which is called Qualified Multi-Tenant Hosting QMTH Provider. So that is up until 1st of October. Again, speculations, but very, uh, trust me, you know, mark my words, uh, that's what's going to happen. From the 1st of October, you will be able to bring eligible products via new right, flexible virtualization that is promised to be applied to more products, even with the server, to any of these providers. So this entire, this ent from the 1st of October, this entire layering of providers should stop making sense should be completely, we'll see, we'll see about that. I'm not expecting it to be that simple. Um, right. List the provider basics, and this, this is where I think Stefan may help me. So, Stefan, sorry for keeping you quiet, and, and I see that you're bored. <laughs> so, I hope you'll be introduced. He talks a whole lot, and then I don't get to say a single word. That's strange, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, yeah. I mean, if, if uh, let, let, let me cover the basics, and then I'll I'll take I'll I'll give you I'll give you a microphone, and you'll maybe add something okay. from you. So, so as I said, they are Azure, AWS, GCP, Alibaba. They have the most restrictive bringer license terms. So, so pay attention to every single nitty gritty detail. It's, it's more restricted than 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 your you know your neighbor's cloud provider. Uh, so, on dedicated hardware, even perpetual licenses may only be brought those that uh, that were bought. Even on dedicated hardware, before October 2019, how I mean, how more complicated can you make it? And uh, Azure, amongst all these four, has a backdoor via Azure Hybrid Use Benefit that actually gives you more flexibility compared to all the other listed providers. So I don't know if you want to add anything about listed providers at all, uh, Stefan? Yeah, absolutely. So the important thing to remember is that also with the listed providers, there are a few little asterisks, um, which depend on when you actually bought the licenses that you have. So while with current licenses, it's, for example, virtually impossible to bring any of your licenses into the space of AWS, GCP and Alibaba, depending on when you bought this and October 2019 is a very important date. So basically licenses that you brought before, if you have some wriggle room to <coughs> bring licenses into a AWS, GCP and Alibaba setup. And then these providers also have a very specific offering, which I would say I haven't ever seen it in use. And I've been around Azure enrollments and Azure customers for the last eight years. But all these platforms offer something which is called dedicated hosts. And as Alex just explained, if the hardware is dedicated to you, you can bring anything you want. So this means if you're going with a dedicated host offering on one of the three big clouds, <coughs> you actually still have the possibility to bring licenses, which you bought through one of the other agreements, into the other big public cloud players. But for all intents and purposes, what I've seen so far out there in the field, um, Azure is virtually the only place where you can bring licenses. But if you can do so, you should absolutely do so. Comparing the cost of these FLA licensing, if you are renting it through Azure with the license included model, and the cost of bringing your own license, um, Azure Hybrid Use Benefit is a significant financial benefit. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Stan. That was actually quite good. So I have a question from Eric. Mm -hmm. uh, yesterday, Louise, so that's confidential, but I'm not disclosing it. You're, you're doing that. Uh, from Luis, that authorized outsourcer is not necessarily SPLA partner if it, it is any Microsoft partner with its own data center. So, 
Yes, that's true. Uh, legally, if you read the, the, the wording, it's it's absolutely entirely correct. But but here's the catch. So before the CSP host the program is is is, is announced. The only way for you to license uh, Mike, to to uh, license Microsoft so, so, uh, software for outsourced hosting is through Splunk. That's why I call them Splunk partners. So technically, I mean not technically, legally the wording is correct. Technically, until CSP host the program is in effect, you can do it only through Splunk. And then I won't disclose I won't disclose the details about the CSP hosting program, but it's not going to be as easy. So uh, well. Um, <clears throat> Alex, can you bring Frank? Any hub, a hub. Well, well, we have a, we, we have a brilliant question about a hub, and for that, uh, yeah, uh, I have a few slides about a hub. So again, let me start, and then uh, okay. then uh, we'll uh, we'll talk about it. I'll mm -hmm. I'll let you answer that question. So, uh, Asia hybrid benefit, hybrid use benefit is only uh, permitted, is only given to Windows Server and SQL Server. Only those two products. It does require either software assurance or CSP subscriptions. Remember, you know, pay, pay forever <laughs> licenses. Uh, Windows Server Data Center has a significant advantage, like huge advantage, because Windows Server Data Center licenses or quarter of the structure suite licenses for that matter may be used at the same time, no time limit, on premises and in Azure. The calculation rules are different, but they may be used simultaneously. We get a lot of the question about, but can we use SQL Server or Windows Server Standard? No, except for quite a long period, six months, 180 days, when you migrate workloads to Azure. Then you, you may still, you may, you may, for example, if you lift and shift something from on-premises to Azure, and you, you, you know that in the end you won't need the licenses on-premises, you may assign those licenses to Azure through Azure Happy Benefits, following all the calculation rules, having active software assurance, you know, doing all this, uh, due diligence, uh, and then for 180 days, you may use them here and there in two places. And then you have to decide whether you keep them on premise or you move them to the cloud. So the other thing that just, just a small caveat is that licenses must be, if, if you assign them to Azure, they must stay there for 90 days. There's no uh, exception to that rule. They must stay with Azure for 90 days. So. That's that's something you need to remember. So, uh, Stefan, would you like to take this? I, I have a slide on it, but I think it's good timing to uh, to to respond to the question. Could you tell me why a hub with Windows Server is so beneficial, while a hub with SQL is bad? Yes, happy to. The big difference is the change in prices that you see if you are going to a Windows Server, and I'm assuming it is running 24/7. So please do not take this advice for a system which is only running five hours a day, then the calculation changes quite a bit. But if the server, the workload is running consistently, so it's a data center operation that you are doing in Azure, um, then the difference between the pricing that you have on the one hand, what you pay for Azure Hybrid Use Benefit with the license that you procure, for example, on a three-year term, an eight-core license pack, and what you would be paying for eight cores with the license included feature in Azure, um, we will do a video on this soon and um, where we actually walk through the price comparison to give you an idea it's significant on the other hand microsoft made the prices for the um, spla sql license or the license included more or less equal to the um, license fee that you would be paying for three-year subscription and if i can pay on a minute by minute basis and pay exactly the same prices on a three-year subscription Honestly, I prefer to take the minute by minute. Maybe I can power down the system for a few days, and then I'm already cheaper. It Thanks. depends a bit. If I can catch one more thing, of course, if you have rebates. So if you are in the lucky position where your company has a significant rebate across all the server software, including SQL Server, then it may still be very beneficial to bring your own licenses in comparison to the um, license included. But if you're paying list prices, then there's virtually no difference. Yeah, least price, least prices in some cases is even higher than uh, pay as you go as, as we yeah, discovered like recently. Three percent more expensive for the three-year reservation list price than if you would do pay as you go. Yeah, so SQL is a bit more. Comp uh, let, let's say it this way: Windows Server is a no-brainer. SQL yeah. Server needs uh, assessment, particular assessment with your particular uh, discounts. Uh, so this is something preliminary. This is something.
But I must tell about it because this training will stay as a recorded video on the channel. We'll obviously release a special video after the 1st of October. We're going to have a live show, by the way, so let me show you that. We're going to, we, we've announced a couple of live shows. Uh, one is the next uh, middle of... Uh, you can see them on the channel. One is uh, middle of uh, October. Uh, so we're going to be talking to SPLA providers, but we will obviously discuss flexible virtualization because it affects both providers, not only SPLA providers, also CSP hosters, a new, new breed of um, uh, hosting providers, but also end users. So so it's, it's kind of like a benefit that touches everyone's interests, uh, financial business interests and, and licensing, obviously, as well. So it's going to be on the 12th of uh, October, Wednesday, Two o'clock though, not three like today. And then the other one is uh, we're going to have a continuation of this series. Uh, we're going to have in the end of November, 23rd, a Microsoft Enterprise Agreement training. So we're not going to have a whole section about all kinds of agreements. We will just compress it to just Enterprise Agreement. And then we're going to have for other types of agreements, we're going to have probably, uh, we'll see about that, additional training sessions. CSP, 100%. MPSA, maybe open value, Mm, I doubt anyone is really interested. I, I get like 5% uh, responses on um, on the question of whether you need a specific training on open open value. It's a shame because it's an interesting agreement, but because there's no interest, I mean, there's no reason to actually even, you know, uh, waste our breath. So, <clears throat> moving on, I need to go back to uh, PowerPoint. Why is it not back to PowerPoint? Yeah, that's it. So, uh, with uh, flexible virtualization uh, and license mobility, we look at them together. So always check if the product has, and the license, it license itself is eligible. So not all products have license mobility. And I doubt, although Microsoft says that the, all products will get uh, flexible virtualization, I doubt that. So I, I will see. I mean, it's not yet official. I think there'll be limitations. So check that the actual product you want to take to a provider has flexible virtualization benefits. Both of these rights, and that's for sure, that's already in the blogs, uh, require either software assurance or CSP subscriptions. Uh, both of these rights will, will, will require, right now, license mobility does already, uh, a specific license verification process where you download the PDF, you fill it in, you send it to Microsoft, and they, they, they send it back to you and say, that's fine. You can take this license to the cloud, to that particular provider. You have to tell which provider you're signing them to. So, so that's it. So the, these are the rights. So not all products are equal. You need to check whether they are whether they have these rights that I uh, outlined here. So, <coughs> almost what just what just uh, Stefan said. Uh, economic tips about bringing your own license. So if you're paying software assurance or subscription fees right now, look for unused eligible licenses and bring them to the cloud because you are wasting money. If you have some subscription licenses, you're not using them anywhere, not on premises, neither in the cloud, you're wasting money. Why don't you uh, obviously check all the other terms and conditions, but bring them to the cloud. The other economic tip is here is if you have an enterprise agreement with Windows Server Data Center or Core Infrastructure Data Center, you are paying software assurance. You have Azure hybrid use benefits. The percentage of the companies, the percentage of the companies that have that right and don't use uh, Azure hybrid benefits is staggering. I'm talking like 90%. They just not aware, you know, or maybe somebody like like a software asset manager, you know, someone like like us, like 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 the you know the uh, viewers of this live stream, we know about it, but the teams that deployed it to the cloud, they either are not aware or they don't talk to us, and what's happening? We're wasting money. We're paying pay you go rates, where you can actually have them for zero on the license part. And then, uh, as, as just uh, Se Stefan said, so Windows Server A Hub provides up to 80% savings depending on, you know, various conditions. And SQL depends. SQL depends. So these are the economic tips. Uh, Stefan, you wanted to say something about this slide? Yes, I would like to share and two experiences which I made in my many years of helping customers um, optimize their Azure uh, economics. The first is, if you have bigger deployments built, then please check afterwards in your billing if all of a sudden um, server license fees start appearing. 
So I had a case in the past where a service integrator wasn't aware that they could use the Azure Hybrid Use Benefit feature. And so they dutifully deployed a correctly licensed environment in Azure, which was all using Windows license included, actually forcing quite a lot of significant or of extra cost to the company. Fortunately, nowadays, this is very easy to correct because it's basically just ticking a radio button on the VM to switch it from the license included to the Azure Hybrid Use Benefit. Um, the second thing, and maybe Alex, you have a few words to say about this. Um, I recently found a customer who was bringing their SQL Server licenses into a dev test subscription in Azure, which to me means that they actually need to pay the enterprise agreements rate on the SQL Server, then we could have gotten it for free in their dev test subscription environment in Azure. Am I right with this? I don't think they're free, are they? I think they, they have it no. discounted. So, so yeah, them. it makes sense. Again, that's that's the case when you need to compare uh, the cost. And I think because 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 are they they are free? Are they? they uh, Everything is check. free in a dev test subscription. It's, it's, there is no license well, fees. The condition is that you put Visual Studio <laughs> subscriptions for everybody working it, it, there. Exactly. It, it's not free. You're paying for Visual Studio, but you get these licenses kind of bundled. So yeah, that doesn't make sense. Yeah, it still happens. So these that are doesn't things, make sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. These are the things that you really need to check out for because we are all humans. Mistakes like these happen. People work on the best assumptions. They try to do the right thing. But yeah, it is intricate. It goes into the detail. And it's so easy to spend hundreds of thousands of euros of dollars over a year with a few wrong choices and a few wrong clicks. Uh, Chris is asking, how do you analyze this? Chris, I, I put this on screen to ask you basically. So, what do you mean? What, what, what analyze what? Could you I please expand it. on your question? I understand. Do you? It. Okay, okay. Yeah. Please, please go on then, Stefan. Chris, if you need an immediate help, please message me on LinkedIn. Uh, it's Stefan Denk there, and this face will look familiar. Um, if it can wait a little bit, then there will be a video coming out there where I share my way of analyzing Azure billings. It's basically I like to dig into the real raw data, so the big CSVs coming out of Azure every month, which tell you what you have been consuming during the past months. And there are some terms which I can share with you, which you can search for to spot these kind of discrepancies that shouldn't be there. But not in this video today. That will be a separate okay. one. Okay. Let's go on. We've got 15 minutes and quite a few slides left now, by the way. So yeah, let's, 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 try, let's try and do it quicker. So how do you calculate licenses for Windows Server and Azure? So you need to assign minimum of, of 16 cores in your first in your first batch when you first use a, a hub. Uh, and that gives you right on the first two VMs to use it up to two VMs. Let's not, Stefan, not, let's, let's not uh, go into the 12 slash 4, but anyway, 16 cores up to two virtual machines with a total number of 16 cores. And then and then uh, to every next VM, you need to assign at least eight cores. And if a VM is bigger, then you must assign license in the increments of eight. So the formulas revolve around the number of eight. You know, say you, you have a VM of eight cores, but uh, you have a VM of 12 cores, you need to assign 16 cores to it. That's, that's the rule. Uh, so uh, a 16 core pack, remember I told you about packs, can cover up to two VMs. It doesn't have to be assigned to a single VM. If you have two eight core VMs, like 16 core packs covers two. Additions don't matter. Interestingly, additions don't matter at all. Uh, Windows Server calls are not required in Azure. RDS calls and um, um, rights management calls are required. So you need them. I have a, we have an article, I, I said I have because I wrote it, on the sumexpert.com about RDS cows in Azure. So please read that. It's a, it's a pretty long explanation of why and how it works. So how do you calculate licenses for authorized style sources? Um, <clears throat> this is preliminary because this is gonna, you, right now you can't do that until the 1st of October, but according to what Microsoft already announced uh, in public, this is what we figured out. This, this, this is us figuring out. Again, I'm pretty sure we're spot on. So <clears throat> the bring your own license right for Windows Server will be governed by flexible virtualization, right? Not license mobility. It's not getting license mobility. There'll be a minimum of eight cores assigned to a VM, which is logical because, you know, so many uh, experts even a month ago said, ah, it's going to be eight cores. Yeah, I think that's what that's what is going to happen. Increments are yet unknown, so I, at least from the public sources, I have no idea what the increments will be. Whether it's going to be eight cores like in Azure, I, I hope it's going to be two cores. It's going to, it's going to be a minimum of eight, and then like SQL Server, you can grow by two, hopefully. I don't know. 
so additions, uh, what I heard again, rumors may have to match exactly. So you would have to assign standard uh, licenses to standard uh, VMs and data center to data center VMs, even without down additioning, which you normally would expect for Windows Server. And then this is the killer. This is like the this is like the killer, which is, I mean, to me makes no sense because everything is upside down. So right now in bring your own license in Microsoft, when you take something to a provider, it doesn't require cows or to Azure. This will require cows. So Windows Server brought to a provider will require cows. So you will have to make sure you have cows. How it is going to work be 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 between your own premises service and, and cloud service, uh, I think logically, you just have to have cows. That's it. You don't have to bring them, but they are required. So, 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 so your users and devices are still required some sort of Windows Server Cal or a Windows Server Cal equivalency, which you get through, say, Microsoft 365 or 5. Yeah, it's, I, 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 can't, I can't stay very basic uh, on this slide, unfortunately, even if I wanted to. So SQL Server, another product, how to calculate licenses in Azure. There's a minimum of four cores per um, uh, either platform as a service VM or uh, IAS instance. If there's a bigger VM instance, you just assign more cores in increments of two. Cross addition assignment is possible and much more flexible than in any other Microsoft licensing model for SQL. And there's unlimited virtualization on dedicated host exactly like, like on, uh, on on premises. So here's an example. It's easier to show you an example. So say we have a SQL Server Enterprise virtual machine, platform as a service, or a business critical um, instance of uh, SQL Server, which is, which is an equivalent of enterprise. You, with eight cores, you can either assign eight SQL Server Enterprise licenses, so one-to-one, -one, or if you have, you know, too many unused SQL Server standard licenses that you don't, you're not using on-premises, on you may assign them to this uh, uh, virtual machine by multiplying the requirement by four. So in this case, you have to assign 32 SQL Server standard licenses. It's actually, in general, cheaper to use enterprise licenses. So, so because we, we, we did that calculation many times, uh, SQL Server enterprises, cheaper, and especially that applies to this particular configuration. So this is a SQL Server standard virtual machine in Azure. And again, one-to-one, -one, you just need two, uh, sorry, eight uh, SQL Server standard licenses. I'm talking about licenses, not core packs. So, so, so watch, watch my hands. Licenses. So that means four core packs, eight, eight licenses. So because, you know, licensing is in licenses. You buy it in packs, you license in licenses. But there's a cheaper option for this virtual machine. You may assign one core pack, i.e. two licenses, of SQL Server Enterprise to it, and it's going to be slightly cheaper. Mm -hmm. And the so, very important uh, bit is what you said, that this is a virtual machine. Azure is also providing you several managed SQL offerings, and you are not able to bring your licenses, for example, to the Azure SQL platform as a service. Uh, okay. <laughs> so, that was that was that was a bit too much even for me. I'm sorry. Right. So uh, SQL Server bring your own license to any provider. So it's a, it's it's already available now. You don't have to wait for the first of October. You can take it to a provider. You need software assurance. There's a minimum of four cores per virtual machine. The provider must be right now before the first of October. And I, actually, through license mobility, it will be the same after the 1st of October. It must be an authorized license mobility partner. Not every provider allows you to do so. Uh, list of providers allow you to do so as well. So you can be, you can take it to list of providers like this. If there's a bigger VM, assign more cores, cross addition from enterprise to standard only. So no double cross additioning like on, in Azure. And by the way, no, no discount. So you can't divide by four. You have to assign the same amount of cores. And uh, unlimited virtualization on dedicated host. I think it's too much for today's uh, session anyway. So, Stefan, thanks very much. I mean, I, 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 I can, I can, uh, if, if I could, if, if I could uh, put you offline because I, I have uh, ten minutes to cover uh, a few sure. uh, Microsoft agreements basics. I think we will overrun for a few minutes. So thank you for all the two hundred and thirty-six heroes that are still watching us. Please share this live. Please click like button. It helps more people to discover this recording. Uh, uh, we're going to keep it as a public recording after it ends. Uh, so, and I'll start with Microsoft Enterprise Agreement Basics. And th thanks, Stefan. We'll see you soon in the dedicated videos. Yeah, looking forward. 
Right. So Microsoft Agreement Basics. Uh, we have a dedicated uh, training from the fifth last year that you can watch for more, but but I'll give you a very good introduction, uh, trust me. So, so there are various types of agreements. So current agreements that you currently can buy uh, are Microsoft uh, Customer Agreements and, and, and underpinning the CSP program and direct relationship with Microsoft. Enterprise Agreement, obviously, you, you may have heard about it. Uh, MPSA and Open Value is still available. And there are retired, uh, retired uh, licensing agreements, which are, um, let me do it properly, uh, open license since, well, this year, but effectively it wasn't even available in 2021. And Select Plus, that, that is still evergreen. You can still put, place orders, but you can't sign a new one. Uh, agreements differ by lifetime, and that is also important. So, as I said, there are evergreen agreements that last forever, like MPSA, Select Plus, and actually Microsoft Customer Agreement is evergreen as well. So, it lasts forever. It doesn't expire. Other types of agreements, so, uh, like, open license is, is an interesting one because the term there was two years f before it was retired for software assurance. I don't think it's even applicable, but what you need to remember is that Agreements like enterprise agreement and open value, uh, they last for three years. So they, they expire and you need to renew them. Evergreen agreements, you don't have to renew. Uh, term agreements, you have to renew. Uh, the target organizations. So, so CSP right now is targeted at small organizations, up to 2,400 C. So in small, in quotes, in some countries like Cyprus, it may be a huge company. Uh, you know, I'm not talking about even countries like Malta or Vatican, for example. Uh, so, open value and open value subscription is in general like for companies up to 300. There's really no limit, but it's the target audience. Uh, I have a graph for it, by the way. And uh, enterprise agreement and MPSA are for larger organizations. And let's not talk about uh, EA. Here are the entry barriers. So, so there's, there's, there's the frequent question like, can we sign an agreement if we only have like 100 users? So here's the answer. CSP does not require any commitments. So really just one license, that's it. Open value, at least five licenses. Again, very low commitment. You know, you need to be very, very small, less than five uh, devices. So users to, to not be allowed to sign a, an open value agreement. Uh, next one is uh, here is MPSA. So uh, the barriers are complex, so it's not really like 200 users, it's a bit around that number, because there are some, you, you may have fewer users, but buy enough server licenses, so th there are entry parties to that, so it's not it's not like an easily available agreement. And then Microsoft Enterprise Agreement, which is the most uh, popular, has an entry body of 500. So if you have fewer than 500 users or computers, you are not eligible for an enterprise agreement, and that may grow up to, well, we hear various promises, you know, 1,000, 1,100, 2,400. It will one day probably move towards 2,400. <sighs> right. Sorry, I'm breathing already heavily because, well, it's been almost three hours, uh, minus five minutes, if you don't count the uh, pre-roll. So, uh, agreements are also uh, have another division, but it's also extremely important to understand. There are transactional agreements. Transactional agreements don't require you to promise to Microsoft to license every user or computer with a certain license. Committed agreements do. They require you, so for you to sign it, to say, dear Microsoft, I promise that every, every um, uh, qualified user in my organization will be assigned a license that they buy through this agreement. So it's, it has different names, standardization, platform commitment, commitment. It's, it's, it, you have to commit to a certain amount for it to, to for even to, to be eligible to sign that agreement. So, so EA and open value are committed agreements, except for open value non-organization wide, but it's in the, in the name, it's not organization wide. So, yeah. And that brings us to the enterprise agreement, to so the most uh, uh, popular one. I have four minutes, but uh, we will overrun a little bit. I'm sorry. So it's a term agreement or enrollment. It, it lasts for three years, as I said. So you have to renew it after three years. You can extend for another three years, but it doesn't make sense. Uh, we have an article on our website that explains uh, more than I'm going to talk today. And we have a training scheduled for the 23rd of November, 
we'll cover all these nitty gritty details about EA in that live show, and you can read the article before that. So again, there's an entry barrier of 500 qualified users or devices. Below that, you can't sign an EA. We, we just recently had a client that had an exception to sign it with 300 users, but they committed a lot to Azure. So Microsoft just said, fine, okay, have your enterprise agreement. So you have to commit, as I said, and software assurance in an enterprise agreement is compulsory. So all, all the licenses, every license in an enterprise agreement has software assurance. You can't buy license without software assurance in an enterprise agreement. Let's talk about the documents. So, so, so we we analyze lots of uh, companies, you know, their their EAs, and I ask them, send me your EA package, and they send me this. It's a very important document. It's called CPS, Client Price Sheet, or Channel Price Sheet, and basically it just outlines all your pricing details for the next three years. And it's not an enterprise agreement. So, so the entire enterprise agreement stack, and it's important that you have it because because all the terms and conditions are, are, are they 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 um, they comprised. What's the word I'm looking for? You have to put together terms and conditions of multiple documents on this slide to understand what you're allowed and what you have to do with your enterprise agreement license. Is that many? So Microsoft Business and Services Agreement on top, then the enterprise agreement itself with all the supplemental forms, then the enrollments with the product selection form, product terms, which is a website. And then you can have CTMs. CTMs are your bespoke terms and conditions. So. If you negotiate a specific term with Microsoft, say, you know, some exception to an enterprise agreement, they will never change the actual enterprise agreement or an enrollment. They will provide an additional document that will have the first three letters will be CTM and then the long number, which will say, uh, notwithstanding to the paragraph this in the enrollment, uh, here are the terms and blah, 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 blah. So your bespoke terms will be in the CTMs. And only then you have your price customer price sheet. It's extremely important for cost planning, but it gives deadly score information about your other features of your enterprise agreement, really. So, so make sure if you have an EA, if you manage an EA, you have this entire stack. Because for example, all these documents are not valid if you lost a program signature form. So make sure you have them all. There are two types of enrollments. Remember I told you about commitments and there are maybe various enrollments. So one enrollment is the most popular enrollment, is the enterprise enrollment, which is for clients, software and services. You say, we're going to buy Microsoft 365 packages in various shapes or forms for our entire user base of uh, 5,000 users. That's your enterprise enrollment. Server cloud enrollment is for service. You, you, again, to sign it, you need to commit to something. So you may commit to one of the uh, following um, components. For example, I'll give you an example, which is quite frequent. We are committing to Microsoft that every SQL Server license will be bought for the whole installed base. So even if you have old licenses and all instances, you have to repurchase those licenses. We're going to buy SQL Server licenses for the whole installed base through the enterprise agreement. And then Microsoft says, fine, we'll sign a server and cloud enrollment with you based on SQL Server. That's going to be your... That's going to be your main component of SQL Server. That's going to be your committed product. You can't sign new SEs for Azure only anymore. It used to be a thing. I think you could still renew them and can still renew them now, but you can't sign new uh, enrollments for, for Azure, just purely for Azure or based on Azure. It used to be, you used to, used to be able to. Um, there's no enterprise agreement without commitment. You need to understand that. So as I said many times, promising as a commitment is promising Microsoft to buy certain products organization-wide, disregarding all the existing licenses in exchange for discounts and benefits. So it overrides all your existing licenses. Plus, remember I told you in the beginning of this training somewhere that one of the mistakes that uh, some companies make is they promise to Microsoft, for example, as I just said, to license every SQL server through the enterprise agreement. And then they buy SQL license through CSP. So that SQL license through CSP, at least on premises, is inapplicable. They can't use it. So they have to now figure out where to use it, whether maybe in Azure, you know, but, but they can't. It's a valid license. It's fine. They're paying for it, but it's, unuse, it, it's unusable during the term of the enterprise agreement. So make sure if you commit to something through an enterprise agreement that your procurement processes is, is tightened down, robust, it, very strict. It, it actually 
checks that every license that you committed to buy through an enterprise agreement is only procured through an enterprise agreement, centralized purchases. Um, <clears throat> two types of uh, agreements or enrollments in EA. One is uh, EA, uh, enterprise enrollment, the other is enterprise subscription enrollment, really, or enterprise subscription agreement, and as some call it. Uh, basically, the the uh, the differences in the name. So one is for predominantly per purchase licenses, the other one is for predominantly subscriptions, and an interesting fact: subscription subscriptions for online services may be bought in any of them. So really, it's just you know talk to your LSP, talk to your licensing consultants, figure out which one is better for you, and just choose it. So there's there's, there's no there's no rocket science around this. Uh, there are uh, programmatic discounts, the ones that you get, uh, the ones that you get uh, through the enterprise agreement just 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 by design. They're in the design, the price list. On any discounts on top of that, maybe either negotiated for you, which you know, for example, we do that, or if you're a government organization, there may be a government deal that gives you additional discounts. So there's a common practice, for example, that government organizations in the Western world may get up to 75% discount off the cheapest level D, but the entire government, all the entities, must be must be licensed through an enterprise agreement. <sighs> right. Uh, EA has spread payments. It's one of the financial features. So, so when 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 you buy products in the beginning, only those that you buy in the beginning. So any any other any other purchases must be paid upfront. But products that you buy in the beginning, you pay them in like in three installments, one third each anniversary, and there's no payment in the end. But obviously, we are not uh, in the world where everything is fixed. Things change. Things grow. Hopefully. So when you commit to a certain product for committed, uh, this is only for committed products because otherwise it's going to be a two-hour-long train. There's a there's a feature called True Up, which allows you not to buy new licenses when you deploy them, but wait until the end of the year and only pay the difference. See, in this case, in the first year we deployed additionally 100 licenses, then we pay them at the first year True Up. Then some fluctuations happened in the second year. We pay the difference in the, in, in the second year true up, and don't forget that even before the renewal, there's a third year true up. You need to pay for the license you are already using. Uh, CSP is easier to explain on the comparison because CSP is, a, is an interesting beast. Microsoft again did a very good job on, on obscuring the uh, mechanics of CSP because you buy licenses as a part of services from CSP providers usually. But anyway, let me explain a little bit the difference of the comparison between EA and CSP. So whilst EA is an actual agreement with Microsoft, uh, so CSP is more of a purchasing model via CSP partners unless you buy directly through Microsoft, through the Microsoft Customer Agreement, MCA. Uh, so you always sign an EA via an assigned LSP, so there must be, a, you need to choose a licensing, uh, what's it called, license solution provider, LSP company, which are few. Not, may, not, not every company has the right to resell EAs. Uh, but MCA terms are passed on to you by CSP. So still, you sign a Microsoft customer agreement between you and Microsoft, but there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a party that is responsible for that to happen. So, so that CSP partner must make sure that you have an agreement with Microsoft, even when you buy license through them. <clears throat> uh, EA is the term agreement, MCA is evergreen, as I said, not going to waste my time on this slide. So EA has annual payments and true ups uh, and have complex subscription rules. MCA is simple and straightforward, really. So uh, MCA is monthly per user, uh, normally, on not all subscriptions, on user licenses like Office 365. You have to normally commit for a year or three years. There is a monthly option, but it's 20% more expensive than, than annual subscriptions. It's still, it's still available. But it's expensive. Uh, you still you still have it. So perpetual licenses are paid up front in full. There's no there's no option. Annual service subscriptions. Uh, we I'm waiting for the clarifications. Uh, what's going to happen on the first of October? Preliminary. I can say this verbally. I don't want to put it on the slide. What I heard is, annual uh, subscriptions for service will have a monthly billing options. Billing, billing option. The three year service subscriptions won't have monthly billing options. Let's see. 
Let's see when it's actual, because right now it's all speculation. Uh, EA has commitments. CSP has no commitments. You know, you just buy whatever licenses you want, so you don't have to commit. EA has predefined discount levels. MCA CSP doesn't have any predefined discount levels. Your prices are set by your CSP, and you have to, uh, to, 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 to negotiate with your CSP to get a discount on your CSP licenses. That's it, not Microsoft. And, you know, it doesn't matter what your volume is. EA has price, fi price fix, and it's a fundamental feature, so that is something I didn't tell you on the slide. So, so the, the, the price of the license you, you order in the EA, when you place the first order, it is fixed until it expires. So for three years, whatever Microsoft does with the prices, they fixed. Usually, it increases them. I was quite interested, by the way, because Windows Server, Windows Server standard price is going down on the 1st of October. How that is going to affect enterprise agreement customers? Will they have a discount? Hmm. Interesting. That's going to be the first precedent in history. I'd like to see that happening. MCA has no price fix, really. You know, so it doesn't. Uh, well, I mean, there are details, but strictly speaking, it doesn't. <clears throat> so... Microsoft EA has licenses like perpetual, perpetual plus software assurance or subscriptions, so there's a choice. In, 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 in CSP, you only have either perpetual or subscriptions. You can't have a perpetual with software assurance benefits. You have to choose straight away. And therefore, you have no software assurance, no software assurance benefits in CSP at all. Enterprise agreement, uh, you get licensing rights via software assurance because, remember, software assurance is, is, is compulsory. Every license in EA has software assurance, so you get all the licensing rights that you get with software assurance in an EA. Uh, in MCA, there are, there's, is, there's no software assurance. There are software assurance equivalent rights. So check per product. So SQL subscription has a lot of equivalent rights to software assurance. Windows Server subscription has a lot of, well, not all of them. Uh, equivalent rights for, for software assurance and 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 and, and etc. So uh, I need to say this: switching from one to another because of this difference may harm your compliance. So make sure you understand exactly when you switch SQL, for example, from EA to CSP, you understand exactly what you're losing, not only what you're gaining. There's a video on this channel which is called something like EA to CSP, is it a good idea? Please watch it if, you, if you're interested in that topic because I, I cover a case uh, in that video. Uh, in EA, there are non-licensing software source benefits. Obviously, there are no software source benefits in, in, in CSP. Uh, <clears throat> licenses, remember there was a question, where do you check your entitlement? Your EA license will be in the VLAC, Volume Licensing Service Center, your MCP licenses. Sorry, MCP, <laughs> CSP licenses are in Office 365 Admin Center. And that is the last slide for today. Sorry to be abrupt. Uh, please tune for upcoming streams. I showed you the page, so it's, uh, uh, I'll, show you, I'll show it to you again. So this is our channel's page. We have upcoming live streams. So today's is not up upcoming. It's going gonna, it's gonna to disappear. But we have this uh, CSP hosting. Please come if you if you're interested in you bring your own license. Terms, uh, Stefan, I'll bring you back to the to the to the studio because maybe some people will stay to listen to uh, our uh, us uh, responding to nitty gritty questions. By all means, why not? And then uh, don't forget about this next session of this training, which is on the 23rd of November, uh, which will talk uh, just about enterprise agreement, but much much more than I've just covered because I've only touched the basics. Uh, the other thing I wanted to encourage you to do is on our website, there's a there's a there's there's an articles page, it's a blog. We have a comprehensive guide about SPLA audits, about SPLA itself, about uh, Microsoft Enterprise Agreement. Why is it not here? I need to refresh it probably. Yeah, yeah Enterprise Agreement, very, very uh, comprehensive article, more than 6,000 words, I think, I think like 7,000 words. Uh, what I told you about core packs, uh, SPLA, so upcoming SPLA updates, uh, our speculations around flexible virtualization, CSP hosted program, new hosting program that's in addition to SPLA, and, and many more. So we have lots of posts like you know, CSP explained, so please come to our blog, read it there, subscribe to this channel, uh, follow us on LinkedIn as usual, and please click like on this video. I really, I would really appreciate it. I mean, you'll make my day. You don't need to subscribe to come, but if you, if you only just 
you do one click on the like button. That is going to make my day today. So, yeah, thanks very much. Stefan, would you like to pick any of the questions? I'd like to, uh, to bring any of them on uh, on the uh, on screen. Let's see. Let's see. I'm scrolling back a little bit to see what kind of questions that yeah. we have. Of course, if there is one which you want to shoot right now, you are top of mind. Feel free to type it in. Um, you can maybe pick up the question about how many core licenses it needs to actually um, run Azure Hybrid Use Benefit on systems running in Azure, because we had a question or two around this um, a little while back. Which is, and, which is that? I'm, I'm just looking. Yeah, Product first, force of use, or sign at least. With the question from. Mm, there was it. There was if, it. If you can give me the timestamp, I can I can put it in. And by the way, thank you everybody who's going away already because I see people are people are saying uh, goodbye. By all means, there's no reason for us to hold you. But if you want to listen to us going nitty gritty and answering some of the questions, and by the way, if, if there was any questions, if we're still here and we haven't answered your question yet, if you could retype it, uh, there's a big chance we'll answer it now because I'm I mean I've, I've got 30 more minutes uh, here. If we take the one from 1846-49 from Abayumi, which was posted. 18, 1846. So it's going to be 1718. 17, <laughs> 17, uh, from, okay. yeah. from Abayumi, um, there I was asked about two core pack licenses. I can use this to um, explain the minimums. This Azure. one? Yes, exactly. That's the one. So yeah, you can buy licenses in smaller quantities, but product terms, if you use Azure Hybrid Use Benefit, actually force you to bring a minimum of eight cores licenses for Windows Server to a virtual machine. And the minimum for SQL is four cores. So um, please don't ever build a two core sync, uh, SQL Server machine because you actually need to put four core licenses on top of this VM. And the best bank for the buck VM in Azure is actually an eight core virtual machine, which you fully Azure Hybrid use benefit for Windows. And then for SQL, depending on the rates that you are paying with your agreement, <coughs> you either use a hybrid use benefit or you are using the license included feature. That's a, I think it took me quite a while to figure this one out. And there is a single exception to this rule that you should always bring Azure Hybrid use benefit. And this is the burstable VM series, because the burstable VM series, their Windows licenses are actually cheaper when going with the Azure Hybrid Use Benefit way in most of the cases. It unfortunately doesn't apply to SQL Server, but for whatever reason, Microsoft only charges a small fraction of the Windows Server licenses on the B series, which are the burstable ones. But more of that coming eventually in the future when we get to release more of the videos we shot, Alex. Hmm. So I'd like to remind everybody that if you want to be certified by some expert, we're not giving certification certificates to the people that attended this session, sorry, but we have an exam which has 80 questions. Uh, I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, we give you three hours to answer 80 questions, which I think is plenty of time. Three attempts to answer those 80 questions. The only caveat is you need to listen to this training and also parts eight, two to eight from the previous training because it covers every single uh, uh, thing we covered in those trainings. Basically, basically, the questions in that training, so exam, are written looking at the slides of the training. So we looked at the slide and thought, what kind of question we would like to ask based on this slide? Because if, if somebody's listened to the training, they would know the answer. And therefore, that's how we formed the, uh, the questions. You may try it uh, because you have three attempts. See the questions. You know, uh, maybe you'll be lucky and you'll go through it. You'll, you'll, you're that clever. You know what, by the way, what we found is that it's easier for someone with an open mind and, and a starter to pass our exam than, than uh, a professional in the licensing sphere. It's mind-boggling how much crap there is in people's head that, that have been to licensing for many, many years. They have misconceptions about licensing ingrained in their minds so deeply, it's very difficult to break them. And, and thus, they make mistakes. I was quite funny because you would expect, you know, like, like gurus and, 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 and elders of this club to be the cleverest. And they are. But it's, it's amazing that they all fail the exam. It's just it's just mind-boggling. On 
on on ridiculous things, you know, because for example, assigning licenses to virtual machines. And then they come to my comments and they start arguing. But that is, but you can. This is, we've always done that. Yeah, well, that was wrong. <laughs> this is what we're trying to do. May be wrong, you know. <laughs> and just because you always done it doesn't give I, you right. <laughs> I'm not always right. I'm, I'm often wrong. This is important. I'm often wrong. Uh, but of all the material in this training has been verified against uh, product terms and licensing agreements so many, many, many times. By the way, that's that's not a siren. That's my son is screaming. He wants me to come downstairs. So, and yeah, thanks very much, everyone. I don't think we have any more. Let's, let's check if we have any more questions. No, I um, think we trusted an audience who was grateful for the training that we did today. And also from my side, thank you very much, Alex, Daryl. It was a pleasure having the chance you, to host Stefan. together with you today, answer all these really cool questions. Thank you to everybody in the audience for asking the question. It was really, really interesting. Um, yeah, great being here. Thank so, you. So, 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 Vendo, and any, any, anyone who still survived and still asked this question, where is the last training? So, <laughs> so here, the easiest, way, the easiest way to find it is to go to our website, Click on the training link on the top here. Scroll to shortcuts. I know it's a bit in many clicks, but scroll to shortcuts. Sorry, I've I've, I've over scrolled it. Uh, oh my, it's just my 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 touch uh, my touchpad is not is 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 not working well. And there's a, there's this link Microsoft License Management Training 2021. It's on the same page. You just need to scroll down. Yeah. And there's here you have all the all the all the eight between. sessions from 2020. 21 on the same page yes it's on our website it's public no subscription no access no no access codes the only way the only thing you need a subscription for is you need to subscribe to a dedicated mailing list in the comments to this video on youtube you need to subscribe to a dedicated mailing list for those who want to take the exam for free in January next year. That's that's it. That's all. That's all you need that for. Otherwise, or maybe yeah, just you know to get the slides from all our trainings because we're gonna we're gonna distribute them only to the subscribers of the mailing list. We don't we're gonna just publish them in public. Make some effort. Sorry, I'll be cheeky, but but uh, we, we, we we I'd like to see I'd like to see some effort from you. So uh, that's it. Um, because we're giving it that away for free. Here are three exam options, which we also talk about on that page. Uh, this this free option, the cheapest is become this channel's member. Become this channel's member. By the way, as you are still here, I don't know what you're doing. <laughs> uh, let me show you something because you you may like it, you may not like it, but I, I must show you this. So we have this we have this um, uh, merchandise shop. It should work in today's life, but it doesn't. Something something broke on Teespring, so it's not working with YouTube today. It's called Swag S W A G dot some expert. I have some merchandise too. I made. I asked me about Cloud Finops T-shirt. <laughs> yeah. So 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 okay. So so what we have here is three designs uh, of various you know like like um, so so one is trust me trust me I'm a I'm a some expert which you probably can see I introduced in the first videos on this channel. Then this is the most popular series, which is uh, called Cloud Cost Optimizer. I did cloud optimization before it was cool. And then uh, and then there's another one, which is uh, I did licensing. I did licensing, sorry, no, before, before it was FinOps. And I did a licensing uh, optimization before it was cool. So we have three designs. There'll be more. Uh, I'm thinking about, you know, uh, pigs, uh, you know, there are no licenses in the cloud and pigs can fly, for example. So, and by the way, send us your ideas. Uh, there is no paid training for SPLA. There is, a, there is, there is, uh, ah, sorry, uh, yet, yet. So, but, aha, uh -huh. this is a big announcement. SPLA paid training, please. Please uh, email, I'll type it in the chat. Please email to ask at someexpert.com. And I'll give you access to the, to the spot training for for a fee, of course. But uh, there'll be a new. We are working on a new project, which is called SomeExpert.academy. It's a domain name, which will have that spot training on it, with a normal payment interface. It's like an online 
online school. It's going to be our own academy, and we're going to be publishing our trainings, premium trainings on that platform. So free trainings will remain free. Premium trainings will be published on that platform. And yeah, and this 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 website that I'm having on my uh, screen right now, it's https swag.samexpert.com. It's a bit cringy, I know, but you know, quite popular among uh, ITAM professionals. I was I was I was quite surprised. It took me like a few hours to put this together, and, and then you know, suddenly everybody's buying it. Wow. So yeah. Thanks very much for uh, attending our uh, training today. Stefan, again, th again, thank you for uh, helping me with the cloud section. And uh, I will see you all uh, in October and November. Thank you, Alex. Cheers. Yeah. Goodbye, everybody. I'll close, I'll close on the silly video that I have here, but, you know, yeah, we can all drop off. Bye-bye. <laughs> Software licensing is a minefield. It's confusing time-consuming, and often overpriced. Get it right, and it can be your greatest asset. Get it slightly wrong, and you risk being non-compliant and possibly paying for software you don't need. And the cloud, it only made things more complicated. Here at Sam Expert, we believe that it doesn't have to be like that. Sam Expert is a global, independent consultancy, a recognized leader in FinOps and Microsoft License Management. We're on a mission to take the nonsense out of Microsoft licensing. Small business through to a multinational enterprise. We have your back. Over the last 20 years, our experts have helped organizations like Western Digital, IKEA, Capital One, Heathrow, Amdocs. We are driven by the passion to get things right to make complex simple, to crack the frustrating licensing puzzles and help you personally take control. By joining forces with Sam Expert, you can be sure you are compliant. What's more, you'll get the best return on investment in Microsoft software and the cloud. Of course, if you're not worried about compliance and costs, there's no need to pick up the phone. But if you are, contact us today.